crypto, you have a world of young people that want their own financial system and their own culture. And it is very powerful, and I'm a big believer in it. From New York City for our audience worldwide on TV and radio, here's the price action. Just a bit softer, weaker, lower, negative down. A quarter of 1% on the S&P on a NASDAQ. A similar amount on a Russell, down about a third of 1%. Year-end forecast out of Barclays, 4,800 on the S&P next year. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Let's sit on the bond market just for a couple of minutes. Switch up the board. Two's, tens, thirties. On the week, your two-year yield up 11 basis points. Your 10-year yield down about four basis points. Two-year up. 10 year down, that's 15 basis points flatter on a twos tens curve. And for the fourth straight session, this curve is flatter, flatter, flatter. Tens down another two basis points to 142.40 with twos anchored. And here is the curve over the last year. It's a round trip, TK. We're back to 81. We ended 2020 yeah, at nice 79 basis points, and we're all the way up through Q1 with all that enthusiasm, positive energy about the outlook, and then all the way back down again yeah. to 81 in, in, basis in points. In other spreads, John, are really almost back to February and pre-pandemic. I mean, there's some real nuances there looking spread to spread. We were working through that positive growth shock, Tom, and this idea the yeah. Fed would be very tolerant of the inflation that might come with it. That story has changed as we close out the year. Looking ahead to payrolls, TK, you know the numbers. 550 is your median at 8.30 Eastern time. The payrolls report just around the corner. And of course, Martin Walsh, John Farrow in conversation with the Secretary of Labor. He'll be looking at that unemployment rate as well. That's what Carl Recadon is looking at. He has a really interesting mandate with Bloomberg Intelligence, his chief industry economist, and joins us uh, this morning. Carl, I love in your research note where you allude to the fact this declining unemployment rate is different than the last time we had a declining unemployment rate. Why is, say, 4.5% now different than 4.5% X years ago? Good morning, Tom. Well, the, the difference really boils down to labor force participation. And uh, you know, we have not seen this rebound in participation uh, that many people were expecting around Labor Day of this year when the unemployment benefits expired and a lot of the uh, uh, schools reopened for in-person learning. Uh, it simply didn't happen. And, and normally, uh, if you're creating jobs at a pace of about 150,000 to 200,000 per month, uh, that's enough to keep the unemployment rate stable. Uh, we're talking about uh, easily double that pace. And so until we start to see that rebound in participation, which yeah. for the reasons that we think is, it, you know, are, are underlying that, uh, that's not going to be resolved during the winter months with the new variant on the uh, on the rampage and case counts uh, picking up dramatically even before that variant was discovered. Uh, I think those uh, same inhibiting factors are going to mean uh, going to remain present throughout the winter months, and that means that we could see a gap lower uh, in the unemployment rate. And if you look at a lot of uh, forecasting inputs to the unemployment rate, uh, they're pointing to a three handle uh, on unemployment. So uh, I, yeah. I would not be surprised if over the next quarter or so, uh, we see really a dramatic decline in unemployment, which just puts that much more pressure on the Fed. Amid this pandemic, are we simply impatient about an improving labor economy? Are we wishing the end of 2021 wishes that we're going to see in 2022? Or are we just in too much of a hurry here to heal this labor economy? I think uh, that that theme applies across a number of sectors, whether you're looking at the inflation, uh, disruptions at the ports, uh, all of these uh, unusual base effects uh, that we're seeing impacting economic data and seasonal adjustment. Uh, it's across the board. So while uh, we're still a long way from normal uh, in terms of many facets of the economy, including labor market performance. When we started talking about this conversation with participation rates, there was a study that really caught my attention yesterday from the Chamber of Commerce of the United States, where about 20% of all respondents said they were not actively looking for jobs if they were out of work. What do you make of this? Can we understand the why behind all of these people who have not and are not even desiring to go back into the labor force? Well, I think part of the why is the transfer payments that were made available earlier this year, which have given some uh, some individuals the ability to uh, take a little bit of a, a sabbatical, if you will, uh, from employment. Uh, maybe if you're in a you were previously in a two income household, and so you can string along uh, with a, a spouse's or partner's uh, health benefits and, and, and their income. Uh, the schooling situation. Uh, 
I, you know, if we're still not totally convinced it will be in-person learning all the time, uh, all of these factors are uh, contributing to that. Uh, market performance may be uh, more of an issue for higher income households uh, and, and older households uh, who are uh, getting closer to the retirement stage. But I think it just is endemic of this issue of not being back to normal yet, and people still having a lot of concerns about uh, health risk uh, from the uh, from the pandemic and from the variants, uh, and so holding off. Uh, the same reason that folks may have vaccine hesitancy. Uh, there's a whole other camp of folks who are still concerned that uh, you know there could be uh, breakthrough cases and and severe illness as a result. And this really highlights how difficult the Fed's job right now is to thread this needle because they don't have any control over vaccination rates or over hesitancy to go back into the workforce for fear of getting sick. How much can the labor market continue to improve even if the Federal Reserve does stop buying bonds and even raises rates one or two times as the market is currently expecting next year? Well, Lisa, that would still be a very accommodative uh, monetary policy position. So the economy should still be able to grow uh, and uh, continue to mend the labor force uh, as that uh, happens. So uh, yes, the change in stance is relevant, uh, but ultimately the stance matters as well. And, and a, a Fed that well, we got some challenges there with Carl Rick. We call that a right technical right issue, Tom, don't we? He's still going. going. His mic's still hot. Disrupt, you can't hear him. Uh, I think markets, should maybe uh, kill that, that mic. Yeah. With an economy that's, that's mending. Okay. Well, Carl Riccadonna, thank you so much. Greatly appreciate that this morning. Some audio challenges there. You think? Yeah. You know, technology was unleashed on Carl there and uh, some <laughs> challenges as well. John, what I find so important here is Mr. Riccadonna focuses on the industries of America. We'll hear from Jim Glassman, who does that much so for J.P. Morgan as well. The real story here is how companies have adapted to this. G given all the gloom overlay that we talk about sure. every day, John, let's remind ourselves, even with the market upset of the last week, Omicron, 34,556, 4565 on SPX, John. It's been a bang up year. Up more than 20%, Tom, on the S&P 500 year to date. This just came from Bank of America. Producer Jamie just shot this one over to me. Let me read this one out. The zeitgeist is the Fed is tightening into a slowdown. It will eventually, but the economy ain't slowing yet. They go on to say, and the Fed hasn't even started tightening. Strong data for the next three to four months will mean inflation, a much more aggressive Fed, a higher terminal rate, and real yields. That's negative the key tech. Into the weekend reading, John, that single phrase is the debate. A higher terminal rate. Mohammed Alarian is saying there is a higher terminal rate and we need to have respect for it. There's a lot of other people. I think of uh, Michael Ferroli at JP Morgan modeling out as Jan Hasi is at Goldman Sachs a lower terminal rate of some measure. This is a conversation Bill Dudley started yes, earlier in the year, yes, Tom. Yes, well said. This yes. idea the Fed will have to take things higher than this market appreciates. Yeah, there's no question about it. I mean, everybody weighing in here, I don't have a strong opinion on this, frankly. I just have great respect for the study of a terminal rate and, John, how far out you go to ascertain that rate. To me, the classic is seven years People could uh, disagree with that. And Lisa, to make this really simple, to ask it in a very basic, easy to understand question, how much work will the Fed need it to do to actually tighten things up, given how deeply negative rates are at the moment? Especially given the fact that a lot of the inflationary pressures are way out of their control. It's not like they can really solve supply chain disruptions or some of the labor market shortages that we're seeing uh, that are occurring. I do wonder, though, that the markets right now are buying what the Fed is selling. They are completely buying into this idea that they can control inflation. And longer term, we have not shifted out of a low rate regime where the Fed will continue to act and come in and backstop markets. What will shake that confidence and create more of a Bill Dudley type of consensus in markets? So I promised you that Barclays note, didn't I? This was the close on the S&P yesterday. 43, where are we? 43, 45 rather, 77, not to scare you. Yeah. 45, <laughs> 77. They're looking for 4,800. And here's the quote. Limited upside for equities next year with a 2022 SBX price target of 4,800. Household and corporate cash hoards should support modest earnings growth, but persistent supply chain woes, reversal of goods consumption to trend, and China hard landing 
a key tail risk. That's the call, Lisa, for Barclays. Just a laundry list there of downside risk for you. Well, which is the reason why you're seeing the yield curve flatten, which is the reason why there is this feeling, as that Bank of America note highlighted, that you're hiking into a slowdown. We are definitely going to be slowing down from some of the peak recovery rates just because of the, comp uh, the, the comparative kinds of analyses that we're going to do. How does this end up bleeding through to markets that are relying on the Fed put? Again, how much of the conviction calls going into next year will be that the Fed will capitulate to any disruption in risky assets. Well, for how long have we been talking about peak data? Tom, the ISM this week for manufacturing in and around 60, we'll get the services ISM Hi. a little bit later this morning Hi. for November. Tom, looking at that data at the moment, that's in and around 60. Right. 65 is the estimate for ISM services later on. Well said. Six, six months ago, six jobs reports ago, a lot of people were modeling a substantially slow economy. You know, this quarter, that quarter, the other quarter. John, that's vapored. That's just gone away. I mean, I just... I don't see a lot of research evidence of a slowing American economy right now. I'm always trying to follow the consensus. It does have a three-handle now for next year. So clearly the forecasts okay. have come in. 3.9% <clears throat> is the median outlook What's now for the, the U.S. economy handle? for GDP. For the month of July, Tom. Yeah, I mean, to get to halfway through the year, I mean, I don't see a three-handle. Yeah, front half, really back invisible. half, I'm, I'm with you, yeah. because Jan Hatzius yeah. of Goldman was talking about getting back to trend in the back end of next yeah. year. That could be one to two if you're over at Goldman. I just wonder how that snacks up with their call for tightening, Lisa. Yeah. To start a little bit earlier on the Fed and then to be looking at the back end of next year with GDP down in the twos again. Yeah, how much the tightening ends up slowing growth. And Tom, I hear your point about uh, all of the growth and the, and the dynamism in the U.S. economy. But ask one person if they feel like this economy is in a better shape than it was right before the pandemic. What answer do you get, right? I mean, if you take a look at sentiment, if you take a look at inflationary reads, no, John, I mean, that to me is relevant when you gut check how much a momentum well, we have. There's two worlds out there. There's a world we cover, which is corporations adapting. And to your point, Lisa, there's another world, which is not about fancy people in bow ties. And guess what? They're struggling. Are you a fancy man in a bow tie? <laughs> <laughs> He's very fancy. I'm just yeah. checking in. Is that Hermes? This, yeah. yeah, I think it is. It was unleashed on me this morning. That bill picked <laughs> Nice. It's Homerian. Okay. We're down eight yeah. on the S&P. We're negative two tenths of one percent. Day it is Jobs Day. TK's unleashed. You always are. I could never get through Homer. <laughs> I could never get through like Iliad. Really? I flunked that. I'll yeah. give you a good translation. Lisa, Cliff Notes. <laughs> cliff Notes. This is Bloomberg. Our listeners are. They know what Cliff Notes are. With the first word news, I'm Rishka Gupta. Economists are expecting another strong U.S. jobs report today, according to a Bloomberg survey. Employers added 550,000 workers in November, and the unemployment rate fell one-tenth of a percentage point to 4.5 percent. One of the questions to be answered, will more people who lost jobs during the pandemic start looking for work again? The price of oil rose after the OPEC Plus alliance took a flexible stance on increasing production. The cartel and its allies decided to keep restoring supply, but it also said it could revisit the decision at any moment due to high levels of uncertainty in the market. And in New York, dozens of hospitals are nearing capacity as the state reported the most new coronavirus cases since January. More than 11,000 cases were recorded. At least five cases of the Omicron variant have been found and 56 hospitals in New York had bed capacity of 10% or less today. State officials will be allowed to limit non-essential hospital procedures. U.S. regulators have sued to stop the chip industry's largest ever acquisition. The Federal Trade Commission says that NVIDIA's proposed $40 billion purchase of the British company Arm is a threat to semiconductor innovation. NVIDIA is vowing to fight on, but with regulatory scrutiny around the world increasing, the prospects, while well, they're looking dim. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Rishka Gupta. This is Bloomberg.
are talking about Bloomberg surveillance. There's some guy out on Twitter who says, I look like I'm on. I know, I know, sir. Do you think I need a lift? Is it time that I... What do they say about me? What did that particular gentleman say about... Let's have a look. Oh, One of Lord. them is near 101 years old. Which one would that be? The other has an ego in the orbit of Mars. <laughs> Who's that? I had no idea. <laughs> Mrs. Lisa, the only chance to productive conversation. It's a fairly accurate summary of this show, isn't it, Tom? The eyes, or should I do the whole thing? What do you think competition is going to look like? Do you think there is going to be a price war? As you say, the fares are available now. You're suggesting they may not be there for, for forever. But nevertheless, talk to me about what you think the competitive landscape is going to look like here. We've seen a bit of departures in this market, and this market has three very strong joint ventures that compete head-to-head -head daily uh, to win the hearts and minds of consumers and businesses in the United Kingdom. So I, I don't see a difference in, um, in the competition. I think we've all focused on Heathrow as the major hub in the United Kingdom, connecting, of course, the U.S., uh, New York, Los Angeles, and other locations. So I see this as a continuation of competition. We've been waiting for the day that we can compete strongly in the marketplace uh, after such a long period of time where it's only been one directional traffic from the U.S. Yep. to the U.K. and now it's open, of course, to U.K. Uh, you, nationals. You mentioned Heathrow. What about Gatwick? We made a very tough decision in uh, March of last year to really focus our efforts at, at Heathrow. <laughs> A lot's happening on Wall Street. It's the basic law of economics. The Fed is telling us this is transitory. Need to catch up? This is Bloomberg Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. We've got the information and insights. David, you just hit the nail right on the head. From business's most influential and instrumental. And that's the way you run good risk management. But we need to invest in our systems. Bloomberg Wall Street Week premieres Friday with replays all weekend on Bloomberg Television and Radio. is first of all the reality that this virus is circulating in a population that is highly immune so that is of course a real concern the good news is that at least for the preliminary data we've seen so far uh, which the South Africans have been great about sharing I must say uh, is that people who are fully immunized uh, appear not to be going to the hospital that's a key point so far from Dr. Chris Barra there of Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. From New York City this morning, good morning on this Payrolls Friday with Tom Keane, Lisa Bravitz and Jonathan Farrow. Your equity market's down seven on the S&P, negative about a tenth of one percent, call it two. Down on the week marginally as well on the S&P 500, potentially looking at a weaker losses. In the bond market, the theme is clear through the last four days, a flatter curve on the week, flatter by 15 basis points or so, down another basis point or two on tens, Tom, to one. 42.91. And maybe off the German announcement yesterday on vaccination, you've got some real weight, little subtle tea leaves in Europe as well. Swiss 20 year lower negative yield. Euro Swissy right now with a 103 handle. That's remarkable, strong Swiss franc. Right now on a Friday, as we plan for the weekend, as we try to stagger through this holiday season with Delta, Omicron, and the other Greek letters I can't pronounce. We gain perspective from Andrew Peckhoff. He's professor of virologist, Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. And of course, Mr. Bloomberg uh, has a modest interest in this TV and radio platform as well. Dr. Peckhoff, I want to talk about the reality of Johannesburg, Pretoria, and the rest. And I want to look at Adrian Purin, who's an internationally acclaimed virologist in South Africa. Tell us the, the, the back and forth this weekend in South Africa as they inform pros like you about Omicron. Well, it actually starts before Thanksgiving. 
uh, sequences were being distributed through the research networks that are focused on COVID-19 before Thanksgiving. So we saw these sequences, and of course, they registered to us as being on of significant concern on paper. But then the Thanksgiving Day announcements of the spread of this virus mm-hmm. through South Africa really gave the entire world a head start. I mean, my lab is ready this week to do Omicron-specific experiments, and it's only because the South African public health uh, and scientific community shared all of their information about sequences as well as case numbers um, so early. The world got a head start, and we are better prepared now to handle this because of their efforts. When will we see results from labs such as yours? Uh, Two things that I'm really looking for now, right now, next week will be important to follow surges in hospitalizations in South Africa, because that's about that two-week window post the emergence of this virus, where we expect to see the hospitalization rates uh, move. Remember, hospitalization rates uh, lag behind case rates. And then as soon as we get isolates, and we have isolates in the U.S. right now, um, laboratories will be telling us how well the antibodies from vaccine and infection uh, cross-react to Omicron. And that'll be that first hint about how widely we expect this virus to be able to transmit. Dr. Pekosh, until we find out that information, it's hard to know whether we're underplaying or overplaying uh, this whole new variant. What would your recommendation be as people head to Christmas parties, as people go into the office, they want to engage with other people? Do you think that it is time to actually restrict activity a little bit more, or do you think that people need to go about their lives and act as though this is just another uh, kink on the way to recovery? Right now, I would suggest two ways to be proactive in a, in a positive way. Number one, vaccines. Go out and get your booster. Go out and get your vaccination if you haven't gotten it. If you've been infected, go out and get your vaccine because we know that that increases your immunity. Right now, we've got a window of time where we as a population here in the U.S. can increase our immunity. And even if some of that doesn't cross-react to Omicron, the more immunity, the better. And it will it will protect us against severe disease uh, if Omicron does begin to spread. And then the second thing is to think about testing protocols. One of the critical things in the Biden plan that may go under people's radar screens is the use of at-home tests. That is an incredibly powerful tool for us to really intervene and stop people who are potentially trans going to transmit the virus. And utilizing those at-home tests is going to be very, very critical to really controlling this Omicron surge. And let's not forget the Delta surge that we're still in the middle of. Andy, because your laboratory is working specifically on Omicron, what is your sense of its virulence? I know that we're going to get the actual data next week, but on a preliminary basis, a lot of people have found that, yes, vaccines do prevent a severe illness. And it does seem like perhaps you're not seeing as much of a surge in hospitalizations yet as you would might expect. What's your sense of what the reality is? Yeah, I think we really need to wait one more week. You know, Darn. <laughs> the vaccination, yeah, you know, travelers are the primary people that have been picked up now with, um, with, with Omicron. They have a tendency to be a more highly vaccinated population. So some of the data we're seeing now from the U.S. and from Europe is really skewed to vaccinated populations. In the next week, um, it, and South Africa will be the lead on this, we'll be starting to hear how the various populations are doing with respect to infection and disease severity. So that's really going to be the critical thing. Andy, always great to catch up with you, sir. It's good to hear from you. Andrew Pekosh there of Johns Hopkins. Next week's going to be a very interesting week to get the data around that variant and look ahead to inflation in America as well. December 10th, the median estimate so far, Tom, 6.7% year on year. Core strip out food and energy, 4.9. They are your estimates, 6.7 and 4.9. I mean, this is China-like nominal GDP. John, I can't frame the numbers. I've never experienced this nominal GDP. Michael Darda addressed this yesterday. And take away all the worries that we have. It's a boom economy. When you have 8 9% Nominal GDP, by definition, that's a boom economy, I guess, for a selected group. Tom, to that point, let's work through it. Think about where nominal GDP is right now. Think about where inflation is running and think about where the Fed funds rate is. And this was the point that Alan Ruskin at Deutsche Bank was making in his research earlier this week. When you look at those things stacked up against each other, Fed's got a lot of work to do. This goes back to that point about do we really 
stall out at 175 on a Fed funds rate? Is that where this story uh, is? And that goes back to the labor economy. I mean, a lot of people are adjusting that Ruskin process because we need to get X million of people employed. I mean, that's the, the constraint against moving to a normal Fed level. Yeah, and Lisa, I think that's the important conversation. It's not about liftoff. May, June, September, take your pick. It's about how steep the path is after that. And if you want to broaden out, it's whether this economy has structurally shifted as a result of the pandemic and as a result of those checks sent to Americans, as a result of the extra debt incurred to allow for a higher inflation rate on a more persistent basis. Or is it what we're seeing, a temporary blip? And honestly, John, that still is undetermined. I've been around Tom too much. I'm not sure these hand actions work on radio that well, do they? No, nope. I don't. no, didn't think so. Priya Misra <laughs> is going to join us. Still do them. Global <laughs> Head still love them. of Race Strategy at TD Securities. She'll be joining us next on the show, breaking down the patience of TD and why they think the Fed is not going to make right. a move on rates. Tom, until December yep. 2023. Anthony from Sparta wants me to do the bird landing right now. Oh yeah, I'm, I'm sure he did. You know, I'm sure he's really. That, that's that's a bird. Yeah. That's the bird landing. It's... That works too, Tom. Does it? Nope. <laughs> Tom Keane, Lisa Rabbits, and Jonathan Ferro on radio and on TV. Futures down four, negative a tenth. This is Bloomberg. responses produced by these by this vaccination is able to potently neutralize the virus and a number of variants of concern. A lot of the vaccines being developed currently require super cold storage. One of the great advantages of our patch is that we're able to remove the cold chain. We've been able to stabilize the vaccine on the patch for at least a month at room temperature and a week at 40 degrees. So this makes logistically vaccine rollout a much simpler proposition, removing the cold chain from transport. Mercedes-Benz is on a path towards CO2-neutral uh, mobility, so we have flicked the switch there, and really, uh, we're going to step-by-step step electrify everything. And what does that mean? Combustion engines get electrified.
this is a much more rapid recovery and we're very far along towards full employment. The risks around what the Fed is going to do are to the hawkish side. They're going to start that journey to normal and we're going to help them on that path. The market's really starting to position itself for a little bit more normalization. There's an extremely wide band of probabilities of where things could go from here on. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Payrolls 90 minutes away from New York City for our audience worldwide. Good morning, good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Live on TV and radio alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Abramowitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow. TK, your market, your equity market, totally unchanged going yeah. into that print. Well, we're waiting for 8.30 this morning and then the, the richness that we see from the two major employment reports. And as you mentioned, John, on to an inflation study uh, next week. What I would note, John, is the Omicron effect on this market. And you really see it with a solid... 103 on Euro Swiss. You see the Swiss 20 year with a greater negative yield over the last 48 hours. And then you saw the news from Germany yesterday. And I wonder if that's not a cloud, but just an, an overlay on this American jobs report. And Tom, as you indicate, we go into next week looking for CPI in America the week after the Federal Reserve. And as you mentioned Omicron, how Omicron dependent yeah. is that Federal Reserve meeting on December 15th? I like that. I like that you've unleashed the phrase Omicron dependent because I think that sort of that's what's different, folks, about this jobs report. We've got this gauze over it. I thought Andrew Peckhoff was brilliant from Johns Hopkins on this. It's just, it's 7.01 a.m. It's a different path to 8.30. And trying to work out, Lisa, the data, one, and then how the market responds to the data, two, as we often do, and that's complex. Especially because it seems as though the jobs market has been I don't want to say de-emphasized, but has lost some of its luster in an argument for the Federal Reserve to hold off on tightening conditions. And we've seen them emphasize inflation. You say Omicron dependent, and yet inflation is not going to necessarily subside. If yep. anything, it could potentially get worse if there is another variant circulating that disrupts supply chains even more. How does the Fed parse this out if they see a real problem with inflation? I've got to say, Tom, these statements this week from Federal Reserve officials didn't sound too conditional about that meeting on the 15th, did they? They were no. pretty straightforward. Let's go. No, the, the, yes, there were a lot of people saying, let's go. I know we've got Priya Misra in this hour, and she's going to say, no, they're not going to let's go. But, yeah, I would say that this week, as we sum up into the weekend reading, is where most of the zeitgeist is let's go. That's true. Let's sum up the price action for you this Friday morning. Good morning to you all. Equity futures now pretty much dead flat, unchanged, down two on the S&P, negative 0.03%. Yields have been up at the front end. Down at the long end, your curve has been flatter. Your yield on a 10-year, again, lower by about a basis point now on 10s to 143. And crude lease bouncing back just a little bit, 2.77% higher to 68.34. Yeah, and really watching, as everybody is today, the 8.30 a.m. U.S. jobs report for the month of November. We are watching how much wages are going up. We are watching the participation rate. How many people are coming back into the labor force? Remember that we've gone uh, way down from the peaks that we saw pre-pandemic. We have not recovered. We have flatlined when it comes to the participation uh, just north of 60%. If there is not an increase in participation, what does the Fed do with that? If this is virus dependent, do they take that into consideration or do they focus completely on the inflation outlook and just uh, adjust according to that? Today, we, I say we, John Farrow will be speaking with Labor Secretary Marty Walsh. I am very much looking forward to that conversation at 9.30 a.m. Always interesting, especially as we talk about the shift of power to labor. How much has that uh, gone? How far can that continue? President Biden will carry the conversation forward with a uh, commentary on the jobs report at 10.15 a.m. And at 10 a.m., we get U.S. ISM services data for the month of November. How much of an ongoing recovery can we see, John, even as we do have the Delta issues that are still Still in place, even though we do have people still remaining out of the workforce because they are worried about getting sick. How much can we see that shift from goods to services in this economy? Can we talk about that estimate? Lisa, 65. Yeah. For people tuning in and perhaps aren't familiar with the way PMIs and the ISM works, anything above 50s expansion. If you're running in the mid to late 50s, mid to high 50s, that's a pretty decent clip. Mid 60s, is fantastic. And Absolutely. we thought that would fade, and that's still the number people expect a little bit later. Absolutely. But how much do we have to recover? And then what is the threat to the Omicron uh, variant? I mean, I know that we don't understand how severe it is, but we already are hearing about people canceling their holiday plans, canceling holiday parties. How go. much does that end up <laughs> affecting some of the recovery? Cancel, I'm not saying, cancel culture with Lisa. Uh, oh, my goodness. <laughs> I'm not saying cancel the holiday parties. I'm just saying hmm. how much does that affect what we are seeing in terms of this Lisa, recovery? Lisa, we've got, we got to disclose the 
skin in the game here. Tom and I have both got trips prepared <laughs> that we need to make <laughs> no sure <laughs> that we go on. There's some real skin in the game here. Lisa, thank you. <laughs> Looking at the Fed calls, we'll get serious, I promise. Barclays for May, Goldman for June, Bank of America for June, Deutsche Bank for June, BNP for June, I think City for June, JP Morgan for September. I mentioned a little bit earlier that TD were looking for December 2023. They were. They're now looking for March 2023 liftoff. And I'm pleased to say that Priya Misra of TD joins us now. Priya, what brought that call in from December into March? Not of next year, but of the year after. So, um, you know, at any point when we're uh, sort of taking the Fed uh, call, it's about the economic data and it's about the Fed reaction function. We got a clear sign from Chair Powell, and I would argue from that November Fed minutes that came out last Wednesday, the market didn't react, but maybe we were cooking or, or eating, uh, or, uh, you know, right before Thanksgiving. <laughs> it, it, the Fed was talking about acceleration of taper when they announced tapering. So it really seems like they're spooked by inflation. And I think what is sort of missed a little bit by the market, they want flexibility, which is why Omicron does not really derail their plans to accelerate taper. They want to be done with taper so they can hike at any point. Now, why are we much later than the market is because we're not extrapolating from the current strong data. This is a, a lot of sort of, uh, you know, post-Delta uh, resurgence in the economy. As the fiscal drag kicks in next year, we actually have growth slowing, we have inflation slowing, and that will allow the Fed to be patient on liftoff. They'll still end taper, we think, by March. And that's when we'll be in this waiting game for is the economy able to handle rates? So uh, this weird, um, you know, uh, rate hike which starts middle of next year but then tapers off. We think that actually is is mispriced. The the, the Fed will have will have the ability right. to start late and then go on to two percent, two and a half, right. a, a sort of more normal terminal rate. Priya, I've said this live that you've got the most interesting call out there right now. How do you link taper talk? to rate rise talk, are they a continuum or are they discrete? Taper talk and then rate rise talk. So great question. There's how the Fed sees it, which is discrete. One should not impact the other. But I do think it's a little odd that they want to accelerate taper because they want to have the ability to hike. So they can't say that they're entirely discrete. I think there's a sequencing aspect. The Fed has been very clear that they're not hiking before the end of taper. So they had to get tapering done. In our view, hiking has a higher threshold. And so then it's going to really come down to the economic data. Maybe I won't be talking as much about the Fed reaction function, but more about the economic data next year, which we think if that starts to slow, the Fed can then afford to wait a little bit. So I think, but but I, I do think that the market views them absolutely linked. I wouldn't be surprised. We get a strong number, which we're looking for today. We're expecting a very high um, uh, CPI as well. The Fed uh, ends QE in March. The market could absolutely price in the first Fed rate hike in March or April of next year. So that front end could still have room um, for rates to rise. This is the irony that people see hot data and then you see the yield curve contracting, which indicates possibly a, a deceleration in the economy or something that's heading toward a downturn. You actually see the uh, economic data coming in weaker than most people are expecting and then a steepening in the yield curve. Is that the better outcome for growth? And frankly, does it lead to a higher terminal rate for the Federal Reserve? It should, absolutely. But I think that the two are linked. The later the Fed can start hiking, the steeper the curve will be. So given our view that the Fed will actually be patient on hikes, you know, the, uh, the curve should likely steepen. It'll also allow the Fed to hike to a more normal terminal rate of 2 to 2.5%. I think what the market's saying is inflation's forcing the Fed's hand to taper, which it absolutely, to uh, accelerate taper, which it is. But whether inflation will force the Fed's hand to start hiking, and then it's a very, it's a truncated hiking cycle. I think that's what the market's pricing in. I would just say the financial conditions are easy. If the Fed is able to be patient, then this idea of a policy mistake starts to get priced out. And I think the flatter yield curve is essentially telling you that it's a policy mistake, which is very odd before the hikes have begun. Normally, the market starts to price this in when the hiking cycle is, you know, well underway. We're pricing a policy mistake, you know, six months before the market's pricing in the first hike. Priya, you're very making odd. quite an original argument here. You think the later they wait, the less chance there is of a policy mistake. The earlier they go, the more chance there is. That contradicts a lot of what we'll hear. In fact, I'll catch up with Mohammed Aleon a little bit later this morning. And I imagine Priya, he'll disagree with you. How do you convince those people that what you're saying is the right way to think about things? So I, I would say for those who say that the Fed is already behind the curve on inflation, why is the end point of the hiking cycle just one and a half percent? 
If the Fed was actually behind the curve on inflation or the market believed that, then I would say long end inflation expectations should have been higher, term premium should have been higher, that 10 year should have been at two, two and a half, or the curve should have been much deeper because, well, they're behind the curve. The fact that as we've moved the timing of the first hike sooner, we've actually lowered the end point, tells you that the market's really not confident that the economy can handle higher rates or that inflation will need the Fed's help or that actually the Fed can control inflation. If this is supply chain related, all the Fed can do is slow growth while inflation can still stay high. So it's the stagflation idea that the yield curve is telling you, which is actually saying the Fed's going too soon rather than too late. Priya, thank you. As always, Priya Misra of TD, now looking for that first move in March 23, not December 23. Priya, thank you. Elisa, just a fascinating conversation. This debate is just wide open, isn't it? Honestly, I loved her argument. I mean, you could disagree with it, but it makes it holds some sense about why would we see a yield curve flattening if people thought that it was the right oh. thing for the Federal Reserve to start hiking rates sooner? And why do we have that terminal rate at such a low pace? And she basically is making the argument the Fed is acknowledging that and is going to hold off for hey, longer. But to both of you, is the basic idea here that Ms. Misra is still transitory? On inflation, Tom? Yeah. I think she doesn't think they need to go anytime soon, which would yeah. imply she believes that inflation I, I story fades. She's the only one left in the, in the game. I wish she'd asked her that well, when she was here. Honestly, so well, she could answer for herself, Lisa. But you, why use the T word, right? If you could talk it's about helpful. because it's, it's at this point it clouds the issue. If you see some of the inflationary pressures subsiding by the end of next year, does that change your outlook for Fed policy? That's probably a more accurate way of putting it. Switching gears just to lighten the mood a little bit. <laughs> this news from RTE. <laughs> This is why I was distracted. Excited. Sorry, Tom. An Italian man who wanted a coronavirus vaccine certificate without actually having the jab tried to play the system by presenting health workers with a fake arm. That news with coming from RTE <laughs> with a fake arm. Sounds like somebody tried in the to NFL. get the jab in a fake arm. That's the reason I brought this up, Tom. With that news out of temper, yeah. we'll talk about that a little bit later. Futures unchanged on the S&P from New York City. This is Bloomberg. With the first one news, I'm Rishka Gupta. Congress has averted a U.S. government shutdown on Thursday night. The Senate passed a stopgap spending bill and sent it to President Biden for his signature. The bill will pay for government operations through February the 18th. Without the measure, the government would have been forced into a partial shutdown after midnight Friday. It's a stunning reversal for Didi, the Chinese ride-hailing giant that went against Beijing to list shares on the New York Stock Exchange. The company now has begun preparation to delist its shares in the U.S., and it will start work on a Hong Kong share sale. Bloomberg reported last week that China is concerned that a U.S. listing for Didi would lead to the leakage of sensitive data. European Central Bank President Christine Lagarde says an increase in interest rates next year is unlikely, but she told Reuters she won't hesitate to act on inflation if needed. The ECB plans to decide on the future of its stimulus measures on December the 16th. And the Omicron variant of the coronavirus is now the dominant strain in South Africa. That's where it was first detected. South Africa reported more than 11,000 COVID cases on Thursday. Omicron has been detected in more than two dozen places, stretching from the U.S. to South Korea. Global News 24 hours a day on Aaron on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Rishka Gupta. This is Bloomberg.
has enhanced search on the terminal to deliver what you need when you need it. Now, you can simply type phrases in everyday English in the command line. Compare financials. Find people. Analyze markets. You can enter phrases or ask questions. What do you want to know today? Ask a question or visit SearchGo to find answers now. the financial world on demand. Hear from leading economists, policymakers, and industry experts via live and on-demand webinars only from Bloomberg. Start exploring to see what's moving the markets. Visit Bloomberg.com webinars. spring and inflation is still over four uh, percent and we've ended our taper and and that's you know that's where we are I think the Fed I will not be on the on the committee at that time but I think the Fed would would have to say seriously this has run too high for too long uh, we need to start using other tools Randall Quiles there the Federal Reserve governor for now saying what he really thinks this is what I love about people when they leave central banks Tom as they're leaving they start to say what they really think. Tom Keane, Elisa Bramitz and Jonathan Farrow, your equity market unchanged going into payrolls, your number 550,000. That's the median estimate. Your payrolls report one hour, 12 minutes away. Yields are in about a basis point to 143.42. And just to complete some of the thoughts of Governor Quarles there in the Washington Journal, in the Wall Street Journal, rather, this morning, Tom, we never said we'd oh. let the army march over us. The army is upon us. So now we'll begin to fire. Yeah, I think it's important for everybody to know the pedigree here. One of the great interests of Powell and Brainerd is they really have a, a, a very different pedigree, a different path. Randy Quarles is Columbia Economics. Let's remember that the vice chairman, Richard Clareto, was chair of the Columbia Economics Department. And then he went on, I believe, to Yale Law as well off the top of my head. But everybody here has got a different template or whatever to talk about, John, about Fed policy, monetary yeah. theory and that. And you got to be, you just got to know who's saying the what. There's a mystery here, though, Tom. Let's talk about it just for a moment. Priya Misra mentioned it. The minutes were inconsistent with the news conference that Chairman Powell conducted yeah. at the last meeting. They were inconsistent <clears throat> with the minutes. Did that chairman deliberately not reflect the consensus on the FOMC in that news conference, yeah. Tom, for other reasons. I'm asking a question here, not making a statement. People are asking that question, yeah. Tom. My answer is I'm looking at the data. We'll see it at 830 and 500,000 is a big number. John, what's the top number? 800,000? 800K at the top And end. they got the revisions as well. There are no revisions in Washington. That's where they vote. Jack Fitzpatrick briefs this morning with Bloomberg government. Jack, no shutdown. So what? What's it mean? Uh, so what is a good question? Yes, we are going to avoid a shutdown once this stopgap measure is signed into law uh, by the president. That checks one big thing off of the December to-do list. 
probably a bigger issue right now is that there's still no action, no movement. Some talks, though, on the debt limit. Uh, that's got a, a hazy deadline, but it could be as soon as mid-December. Uh, there have been talks between Senators Schumer and McConnell on how to handle that, but every mm. senator I've talked to says there's no plan, and they, they may yeah. need a couple weeks to get moving on that. So there are a lot of other uh, hard deadlines for them now. My amateur analysis of this is the Democrats have been never been more separate from the Republicans on this. What's the incentive for any Republican to cooperate with the Democrats on the debt limit. I just don't get it. There's no incentive, and the way it looks like this is probably going to play out, and the Republican demand is Democrats need to act through the budget reconciliation process, which is how they're passing uh, or trying to pass this tax and spending bill, which allows them to do it without Republican votes. One, that allows Republicans to not vote to raise the debt limit, which has a political benefit for them. Uh, two, through that process, you can only raise the debt limit rather than suspend it, which means Democrats have to come up with a number well north of $30 trillion decide on that, vote without Republican help, uh, and then go defend themselves on the campaign trail. So uh, that looks like the way it's going to play out, but Democrats have not started the process of getting that moving. And again, it could take a while uh, before the deadline to, to prep that. Uh, and, and they're hesitant to do it probably because of the political uh, uncomfortable aspect of, of voting alone on a high debt limit number. All right. And of course, we can dovetail the jobs report that we're going to get in about 70 minutes time into this conversation. Take us into the spin cycle, which we'll get right after that, uh, with Marty Walsh, With uh, although that probably will not be a spin cycle with John Farrow. And then, of course, uh, President Biden giving a, uh, a speech. How much are we expecting them to try to use it as a way to push forward some of their legislative agenda? Uh, yeah, so the president is supposed to talk about the, the jobs report at about 10 15. Um, on the legislative agenda, that it, it ties into one, the concerns that the president has, has sought to uh, acknowledge, at least on inflation. When you hear him talk about rising prices and inflation, you hear about the flip side of that and the fast recovery in terms of the unemployment numbers. Uh, it, 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 it doesn't necessarily fundamentally change anything on how they're going to try to uh, push this upcoming tax and spending bill through in Congress. It may be easier, actually, for them to do that if the economy weren't ramping up so quickly and it needed legislative action. Uh, a lot of the, the high jobs numbers and the high price increase numbers have led to uh, some skepticism by moderates, such as Joe Manchin, on how much do we want to front load the spending in this? How, how much inf inflationary pressure do we want to create? Uh, yeah. I, I don't think it would necessarily make it much different. And it does help the president have good jobs numbers, uh, but it's it's not necessarily convenient uh, for the legislative outlook because it, it kind of undermines the push for some major change in action from Congress. Which brings us to where we began this segment, talking about the Federal Reserve and the confirmation battle for Chair Powell. Tom Cotton, yesterday in the Wall Street Journal, he is a Republican senator from the state of Arkansas, came out and said he would not uh, support the renomination, the uh, reconfirmation of Chair Powell because of the inflationary pressures, because of the dovish stance he's taken. How much is Tom Cotton an outlier, and how much does he represent an increasing mainstream in uh, the Republican Party? Um, I wouldn't describe his view as far outside the mainstream, but one factor that plays into that is there's not a lot of pressure on the minority party to help the majority party, even if it's in reconfirming someone who was originally uh, put up by a Republican. There are some Republicans who have said they like Powell. They, they obviously saw him as a, a better option than the alternative in Brainerd, um, and, and so it, it appears that there would be at least a few Republican votes and not a lot of uh, Democratic defectors. So the, the whip count probably looks good. Uh, but again, if, if this comes down to are you going to vote to reconfirm someone who is working uh, with the Biden administration, there are going to be a number of somewhat mainstream Republicans who don't feel the pressure to, to give their votes. And the inflation concerns uh, support that. That's that's something that's going to come up on the campaign trail. It may not be something that tanks 
Powell's reconfirmation, but it's a, a major talking point. You're going to hear it from a lot of Republicans. Jack, thank you, sir, for catching up with us. Jack Fitzpatrick, you just wonder, at least if certain people are trying to position themselves for a certain race at some point down the road in the future yeah. by not backing Chairman Powell. Theoretically. That quote from Senator Cotton in full. The core mission of the Federal Reserve is to maintain price stability and prevent inflation. Jerome Powell has failed to do both. I cannot support his reappointment. Pretty blunt. Pretty blunt, and it really does uh, sort of push forward this narrative of inflation as sort of the key 2022 talking point for the political races. Not as blunt as Senator Warren, Tom, but for the first time, I think we can say Senator Warren and Senator Cotton agree on something. Is that fair? Um, okay, yeah, maybe, yes. I think that would be true. I still say Chairman Powell was handed a pandemic. Agreed. Futures on the S&P. Hard not to. Yes. <laughs> From New York City, this is Bloomberg. extra trillion dollars in spending, not increase inflation? By increasing the productive capacity of this country. And uh, that's a very important thing that we, frankly, have not successfully done across most of my lifetime. You know, I've been waiting for this legislation for months since I became transportation secretary, but various presidents have been hoping to reach this day for decades, and it hasn't happened for all kinds of reasons. The American public has been rightly impatient. Now we're getting it done, both making up for lost time and laying a better foundation for the future. Let me also point out to the fact that part two of the president's agenda, what I like to call uh, the big deal, but part two of that, the, the Build Back Better Act, has even more that will help beat back inflation by lowering some of the costs that Americans feel most acutely, the cost of child care, the cost of health care, the cost of housing, the cost of prescription drugs, bringing those down while also making sure that we ease some of those labor market issues we have by making it easier for working parents to afford to go back to work. invest. We'd like to get that number up to 95 plus percent. Investing should be as ubiquitous as shopping online. It should just be something that people do.
This is how you expect to set up going into payrolls, unchanged on the S&P. That's where we are. Futures going nowhere, positive just a point on the S&P, up by 0.03%. Muted price action on the NASDAQ, on a Russell, up by a little more than a tenth of 1%. Your data, 60 minutes away. Your median estimate, 5.50. Morgan Stanley at 5.60. We'll catch up with Alan Zetner, the lady behind that number, in just a moment. Switch on the board and get to the bond market in twos, tens, and thirties. You know the theme through the week, two-year yields higher, ten-year yields lower, the curve flatter this morning, two your yields higher by just a basis point, your 10-year yield down by almost 2 to 142.74. That's going to be a key theme for this market, this flattening of this curve and how this market responds to that data in 60 minutes' time. As we approach that Fed meeting on December 15th, the day after December 16th, a Bank of England decision. Switch to the board and finish on cable. Tom Sterling, weaker on the day by about a third of 1%. The Hawk losing just a little bit of conviction going into that Bank of England meeting. I'm talking about Michael Saunders, formerly of City, now of the MPC over the last few years, Tom. Wavering just a little bit on yeah. the Omicron variant. Are we Omicron dependent on Threadneedle Street on December well, 16th? Well, uh, John, I think we're Omicron dependent everywhere. They certainly we heard that from Andrew Peckhaus of Johns Hopkins uh, University. I'm, I'm sorry, the Omicron overlay, which wasn't there three, four weeks ago, is there this morning. When you're going into that blackout period, you want some guidance, a clear steer. Not conditional this, conditional that, on the one hand this, on the one hand that. And that's what Michael Saunders gave you today. Cable right now, 132.64. Sterling weaker by a third of 1%. That's the cross-asset price action. Let's get you some movies this morning and say good morning to Remain. Morning, Remain. Hey, good morning, John. Keep an eye on NVIDIA. Of course, that company had tried to buy Arm, the big UK chip maker. That was a deal announced more than a year ago, a $40 billion deal. It met immediate pushback from some of its competitors, as well as regulators in the UK, as well as in the European Union now the United States government, the Federal Trade Commission here, suing to block that deal. Remember, NVIDIA was pretty much just a niche player in the semiconductor space about a decade ago. It now has a pretty broad breadth here across the industry. A lot of its competitors say allowing NVIDIA to buy ARM, that's just a bridge too far. Keep an eye on that space. Keep an eye on DocuSign. Company reported earnings here. A big drop in billings, or I say a big wow. miss in billings growth uh, in the most recent quarter and a forecast that also was even worse uh, than what we saw in the quarter here. Down 32% here. And the worst on the street right now is that the pandemic bump that this company had gotten, that that is well over here. Don't expect that going into 2022. Zillow share is slightly higher here. The company finally starting to unwind its eye buying businesses is making progress there. Also instituting the share buyback. That's given a little bit of a pop to the shares. Uh, flip of the board, we actually did see a pretty big pop earlier today. DD was actually up about 15%. Is now reversed that and is now down 9% here. We're going to uh, start the process of delisting from the U.S. less than six months after coming to the U.S. and then find, finally list over in Hong Kong. Keep an eye on that space. Keep an eye on Grab Holdings, which uh, had its debut in the U.S. market yesterday, dropped about 20% via a SPAC deal, recouping some of that today. And Uber and the rest of the ride-hailing and food delivery companies are uh, in focus today over in Europe as the European Union considers stricter rules with regards to how these companies classify their employees. Romain Bostic, thank you so much. A stock update. Look for that this afternoon to close as well. Right now, on this jobs day, it is very good to focus on, say, a given statistic. And with Ellen Zentner of Morgan Stanley, we can do that. It all folds down to the unemployment rate. Her call, 4.4%. And Ms. Zentner, what interests me is the 4.4% of this December. What's it like compared to the 4.4% one month after the pandemic, the March report? Or for that matter, back to the prosperity of 2017. What kind of 4.4% 4 is this America? Well, I think the, the, the mix of the labor market, uh, of those that are employed and unemployed, uh, is quite different. Um, of course, we've had a record wave of retirements uh, deemed the, the great resignation, but really it's, it's about retirements that are running well ahead of what age alone would suggest. And so that's, that's quite different. And look, downturns, we always see uh, an increase in retirements. But you could imagine this would be much more severe, especially with health concerns around COVID, and especially <clears throat> with the amount of wealth creation that we've had as well, um, allowing people to retire, government assistance allowing people to make those decisions to retire. Uh, and so I think that that's the main difference between the, the pre-pandemic labor market uh, and today. Are we a fully employed America or are we two Americas where one America is fully employed? So, you know, I, I think that it's, it's not 
fair to separate the two um, because we should care about all. Uh, and so we can't reach full employment until it, re it reaches everyone. This is part of the Fed's inclusive maximum employment mandate that the recovery should be inclusive for all. Uh, and so, uh, you know, we're seeing wave of retirements uh, across all income sectors. Uh, and we're seeing, you know, companies have to pay up in order to get workers. Um, it's actually occurring most pronounced in the lower income groups or lower uh, uh, wage paid sectors. Um, and that's where actual nominal wages are outpacing inflation. They're not outpacing inflation for middle and upper income households, um, but they are outpacing inflation for lower income households. So actually the tight labor market um, is offsetting a lot of the painful inflationary pressures that households are experiencing as well. Ellen, you and the team have got together and put together quite an outlier call for next year, which is no hike from the Fed. You're looking for Q1 23. Earlier this week, you put out the balance of risks around that call, and I want to share it with our audience. You said if supply, both goods and labor, remains constrained for longer and inflation remains elevated at the same time, we see hawkish risk to the policy path, putting our call of liftoff in 23 at risk of earlier delivery. And in that dynamic, waiting for supply constraints to heal, was a key feature of the patience behind the Federal Reserve. Why is that now seen as potentially hawkish with this Fed? What's changed, Ellen? Yeah, so I think that, um, you know, it, it does smack a bit of 2018 when the message was the balance sheet runoff is going fine, it's going fine, it's going fine, and then, oh my, oh my God, it's not going fine. And so it was this message, and, and this is why markets have been quite volatile when the Fed makes a sudden change in message. Uh, and so it was that, this is temporary, this is temporary, this is temporary, and then, wow, it may not be temporary. Um, and so at the very least, uh, you have to speed up the taper because when you're tapering the balance sheet purchases, you're still providing accommodation. Why are we still providing accommodation, further accommodation to a strong economy? So first and foremost, you pull back on that. But policymakers also see it as giving them optionality in case we turn the corner into the new year and the, the easing in supply chains that we are already seeing, if that does not be through into slower growth and in inflation. Uh, and so you um, want to buy that, that optionality. The, where the risks come from, and I think this is interesting, John, because I think it, some folks think it might be counterintuitive, is the risks around Omicron is that the Fed has to hike earlier, not later. Uh, and that's because you have sort of another supply shock compounding uh, on top of the current supply shock, which creates even higher inflationary pressures that last for longer, that would be your worst case scenario with Omicron, right? And that's a Fed that actually has to hike earlier. Ellen, let's go there. This is fascinating. The idea of the Omicron threat, even if it slows the economic trajectory, causing sooner Fed hikes. Are we saying that the Federal Reserve now will respond to what ultimately are supply chain shocks that they have no effect on and that they're going to de-emphasize a labor market that probably would be affected by that kind of Omicron wave? Yeah, so it's, it's look, the Fed is in a very tough spot. Um, politically, they're getting backlash from both sides of the aisle to control inflation. Um, inflation does harm lower income households more. As I, as I pointed out though, nominal wage gains for lower income households is outpacing inflation. Um, but you wanna recognize that inflation, uh, uh, you know, is dis disproportionately impacts households in the US. And so at the margin, cause you make a very good point, what can the Fed do about pandemic related prices. They really can't. Um, but they can uh, dampen inflation expectations, dampen uh, uh, household demand for domestic uh, services, domestically uh, 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 produced prices. Uh, and in that way, they can kind of control inflation. I, mean, I think they're looking at longer term inflation expectations. And yeah, they're still in the realm of being anchored. But as we saw from the minutes from the November meeting, and this is very sort of Fed speak, right? They looked less well anchored. Um, and, you know, inflation expectations can go parabolic. They can, they can really change on you quickly. And these are folks that have lived through the 70s, as I have, and remember how scary that can be. So I think putting the focus on inflation is right at, at this time, and then let the data come in and show that inflation is slowing. We think that it will show that February, March next year, as we're getting data that, that shows that these pipeline inflationary pressures are easing because we're getting more supply. So we're, we're saying Omicron's a risk right now, but it may not be 
uh, worse than, than Delta. And of course, Delta's hit on the economy was really a third quarter issue for the economy. And now we're rebounding strongly with fourth quarter growth that's tracking 8% plus. Unreal numbers. Ellen, fantastic to catch up with you, as always, particularly on Payrolls Friday. Ellen Zender there of Morgan Stanley. Lisa, that line, the risk around Omicron is that they have to hike earlier, not later. Fascinating. And really, it highlights the shift that we saw in the Federal Reserve. Remember when they were talking about how the supply chain disruptions were not something that Fed hikes could really address? That seems to be a shift. Suddenly, this is something they have to address. It is more persistent. It is something that is crimping the economic growth in the country. It's something, Tom, we picked up on in the pre-release statement from Chair Powell going into his testimony. He used this phrase, inflation uncertainty. Inflation uncertainty. And we kept coming back to that. What does that mean? It's clear what it means now. It's inflation risk to the upside off the back of this variant, Tom. Well, there may be inflation uncertainty, but as David Rosenberg, who really pushes against this discussion, says, you've got to partition all the different slice and dices of inflation. And I, I think, again, we just need to see more data. And I'll be blunt, Priya Misra, David Rosenberg, some select others, they're way, David Blanchflower, they really push against the zeitgeist of a permanence to this new inflation. They are saying, wait, 49 minutes away. That's how long you've got to wait until we get the payrolls report. Jobs Day in America, Payrolls Friday. Your labor market report comes at 8.30 Eastern time for the month of November, just around the corner. From New York City this morning, good morning. Futures basically unchanged. From New York City, this is Bloomberg. With the First Word News, I'm Rishka Gupta. Economists are expecting another strong U.S. jobs report today, according to a Bloomberg survey. Employers added 550,000 workers in November, and the unemployment rate fell one-tenth of a percentage point to 4.5 percent. One of the questions to be answered, will more people who lost jobs during the pandemic start looking for work again? The Bank of England's leading hawk sees some benefit to waiting for data on how the Omicron variant is affecting the economy. Michael Saunders says Omicron will be a key issue at the BOE's next meeting December the 16th. That's adding to speculation the central bank may delay a move on interest rates until next year whilst it waits for more news. The price of oil rose after the OPEC Plus's alliance took on a flexible stance on increasing production in the cartel and its allies decided to keep restoring supply but it also said it could revisit the decision at any moment due to high levels of uncertainty in the market. And in New York, dozens of hospitals are nearing capacity as the state reported the most new coronavirus cases since January. More than 11,000 cases were recorded. At least five cases of the Omicron variant have been found. And 56 hospitals in New York had bed capacity of 10% or less today. State officials will be allowed to limit non-essential hospital procedures. And Berkshire Hathaway's Charlie Munger says the current environment is even crazier than the dot-com boom of the late 90s that led to a bust. He told a conference in Sydney that markets are wildly overvalued in places. He also said he wished that cryptocurrencies didn't exist. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. talking about Bloomberg surveillance. There's some guy out on Twitter who says, I look like I'm on I know, I know, one. sir. 
Do you think I need a lift? Is it time that I... What say about me? What did that particular gentleman say about... Let's have a look. Oh, One of Lord. them is near 101 years old. Which one would that be? The other has an ego in the orbit of Mars. <laughs> Who's that? I had no idea. <laughs> Mrs. Lisa, the only chance to productive conversation. It's a fairly accurate summary of this show, isn't it, Tom? The eyes, or should I do the whole thing? What do we know and what don't we know? Because there's a lot of speculation, a lot of anecdotes circulating right now. Omicron definitely has the characteristics to create us concern for many reasons. But... Uh, also, we have been preparing for a moment like that for months right now. And uh, I feel comfortable that the playbook will work. So what is the playbook? One, it is to understand more about this virus. The second, of course, will be to protect against infections. And the third is to treat. Let's take it one after the other to understand. I think there are a few things that uh, are not very clear yet with them. One, it is the clinical manifestation of this new virus. Is it creating more severe disease or not? Is it transmitted easier or not? Is it going to younger or older people? All of these are things that uh, as we see clinical cases coming out and the numbers are getting bigger, that's something that we will know in a few weeks. A lot's happening on Wall Street. It's the basic law of economics. The Fed is telling us this is transitory. Need to catch up? This is Bloomberg Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. We've got the information and insights. David, you just hit the nail right on the head. From business's most influential and instrumental. And that's the way you run good risk management. But we need to invest in our systems. Bloomberg Wall Street Week premieres Friday with replays all weekend on Bloomberg Television and Radio. to put your head around any narrative. Let's just be honest. We've had sort of a shift in, are we in some sort of stagflation fears moment? People were talking about that all day yesterday. From New York City. In London. In Sydney. In San Francisco. 9 a.m. in Beijing and Shanghai. Good morning, everyone. Have a great evening. So recap the headlines. You do not want to miss this How story. How are you thinking about those dynamics? we have now here is this mirage of spare capacity. Our spare capacity analysis comes out as half what the market deems it to be at around 5 million barrels. And that's how you get to 150. You kind of, your fundamentals are saying around 120. And then it's the market saying, we've got no, we've got no cushion here anymore. What you just heard there from Christian Malik of JP Morgan out of the London team, out of Europe, Tom, was the path towards 125 on Brent next year, 150 thereafter. Yeah. But people who have engaged with us on that interview in the last 24 hours, thank you. We appreciate some of the incoming views on all of this, Tom. But ultimately, what underpins that view from JP Morgan is spare capacity at OPEC+. Plus. The market consensus is something close to five. Sebastian talked about it. It's actually about 4.8. His view is that it's something closer to two. That's a big spread, 2.8 million barrels. That's a big spread. Will Kennedy added value for you, John, in the 9 o'clock hour yesterday and me as well on radio. And he made very clear that there's some real complexities here. And the shock was what the U.S. and Saudi Arabia maybe did or did not do yesterday that led to that move uh, in oil. And the real surprise from the Russians for that. What I would set up, John, into the weekend and the reading here is the idea of a J.P. Morgan... Francisco Blanche at Bank of America and others looking for higher prices and very lonely is Deutsche Bank looking for a markdown here under $60 a, bar a barrel from their hydrocarbon team. If I can speak for Jeff Curry and the team over at <clears throat> Goldman right now, Lisa, their view seems to be that we priced out too much demand, priced out too much demand out of the forecast off the back of the Omicron variant and we did it really quickly. You think about that Friday, last Friday, a 13% move on crude just like that, blink of the you, eye. And when you look at a lot of the corporate <laughs> prognostications, each wave of uh, of the COVID variants have actually led to less of a disruption, right? Yep. And I think that that might be something that edifies Jeff Curry's view. I want to build up the price action for you going into the economic data in about 41 minutes. 41 minutes away from the payrolls report. 550 is the estimate. Going into a TK, futures up five, advance at a tenth of 1%. Yeah. Yields in a basis point on tens to 142.91. But you know the theme this week, the 
curve is flatter. Two-year yields higher, 10-year yields lower. This is a really nuanced Bloomberg terminal right now, folks, and particularly with strong Swissy, 103.94 is strong Swiss. That's big news for SMB. And as John mentions, a curve flattening off the vanilla curve, the two tens, some of the other curves showing that angst as well. John, what I would go to is a two-year yield and to watch it at 8.30, 0.6250. Back through 60, 65 yeah. last week. We've brought back on, brought well, back forward that conversation about rate hikes. I'm looking at two tens, Tom, back at 80 basis points, basically where we started the year. It's a full round trip, January out to December. Green on the screen, the VIX from a 28 into a 27.23, which is a good time to drag Kriti Gupta uh, in here with a chart. And Kriti, you link the equity markets into this jobs report. I do. And we're looking at the dynamics between the two, essentially how much of the stock market is really driven uh, by what you're seeing in the economic data. And there was a time when poor economic data was a good thing for the markets because it meant that Fed support, well, they wouldn't stop dropping, uh, holding your hand, I should say. But our chart <clears> of the day today really shows that correlation, that dynamic. And for our radio audience, it really is that buildup that you've seen in the last couple of months. Essentially, that good news under in the economy is actually good news in the markets, and that's really just been a dynamic for the last couple of months in this well, post-pandemic era. And it's a red zone, green zone chart, and all you got to know on radio is there's a whole bunch of red away from this correlation, and all of a sudden, boom, the correlation flips. Why? Right. Well, because you start to price in uh, those rate hike bets, and that's really started uh, really after the summer in particular, and today is going to be the first real test since that Powell mm. pivot about whether that trend actually stays or whether we go back to that bad news is good mm. news dynamic. Critty, this really goes, goes to the tech stock area, basically how uh, interest rate sensitive <clears throat> are they? And the view on that has shifted, right? People saying that actually they can be a bit immune immune to rate increases because their businesses are so strong. They generate so much cash. People will still stick with them. What's your sense of how much there is this knee-jerk response to the potential for higher rates in the tech sector? Yeah, Lisa, tech wears so many different hats. And on the one hand, it is extremely interest rate sensitive. But on the other hand, it also functions as an inflation hedge in that fact that it's just so big. We were talking about Apple yesterday with their supply chain issues and their demand issues. At the end of the day, they still have $190 billion on their balance sheet, extremely low uh, corporate credit rate lines that they could draw up on <clears> and buy back. So it's that kind of dynamic that makes essential, essentially some of these big tech companies <clears> in their own league, separate from large cap companies broadly, that can also eat those inflation One costs. One final question. Do you want to guess non-farm payrolls out to three digits? Like, do you want to go on a survey 550,000, 342, or are you going to go more specific than that? Uh, I heard it's 575 is the number to go for. Really? 575. Does she know the cameras are rolling, John? <laughs> I always think it's high risk to put out a number, but the median's 550, pretty, so... Pretty. Whatever. It's a surveillance way. We never guess these reports. Noted it's, for next time. It's a massive <laughs> lose, lose. That was a joke. 575 from Dr. Gupta. We'll see how that does today. John, I'm looking at the 210 spread, and maybe that's the doctor of the street, and we just got near a 79. Hello, Tom. 550's the median, 800's <clears throat> the high, 375's the low. Lisa, everyone, Revision. throwing darts. Throwing. throwing darts with a blindfold on. But here's the weirder part of that, is that which aspect of the labor market report is going to even matter? <clears throat> Right? I mean, are we going to be looking at wages? Are we going to be looking at participation rate? Is the headline number going to be the one that matters? John, honestly, I'm not sure. If we see the participation rate move meaningfully, that could be more important than the headline. We want to see the participation rate move meaningfully. Tom, that's what the Federal Reserve's waited all year for. It just has not developed. You had that kick higher as we reopened, and it's just flattened well, out over the last few months. I agree. It's a social statistic, but I believe I heard from Ellen Zender, Morgan Stanley... She's not that focused on it, given the gyrations of this pandemic economy. The Fed was focused on it. They seem to be less focused on it now. Tom, yeah. almost exclusively, it was mission, get back to where we were. I don't know if it is anymore. We're back to where we were in Nebraska. I just looked at Wyoming, 4.1% unemployment rate. They're almost back to February. There's different stories here, John, away from X million of people still unemployed. And Tom, you've captured the political divide, and that political divide, Lisa, has been what's playing out all year down in Washington, in fact, for the last two years. 
I wonder how much the political divide is what's coloring the conversation on inflation, considering the fact that this is a hot-button political issue. I also uh, keep going back to Ellen Zentner's call that if there is a significant pickup in Omicron viruses that actually does, virus cases, that actually does impede the economy, yeah. that that could actually lead to a sooner rate hike. This is a total shift with respect to how important the labor market is yeah. versus inflationary pressures. John, what's Secretary Walsh's call? I'll ask him, Tom. At night, his call is let's pass this real legislation, let's have some yep. form of fiscal stimulus, and let's create jobs. I mean, it's totally removed from a lot of the Wall Street analysis. But Tom, I think it's fair to say this administration wanted to run this economy hot. They wanted yes. to do things differently to what yeah. we've done in the past. Yeah. This Federal Reserve is starting to go in a different direction. They were pretty well aligned for the last year. I don't think that's true anymore, Tom. No, I agree. That's going to be kind of the core of the issue that we have when we have this conversation a little bit later this morning. I've got to try and tease that out of Secretary Walsh. Oh, you're good at teasing it out, you know. Oh, I mean, not a blunt it's, at it's, all. It's, no. you know, you know, it's, it's, I'm already into my surveillance nap by the time you're talking to Secretary Thanks, Walsh. Thanks, Tom. So, yeah. I appreciate that. I think you're live on air on Bloomberg Radio at the yeah. same time, so I'm sure yeah. Mr. Sweeney Sweeney's, appreciates Sweeney's the fact it up. that you're half asleep. <laughs> He's picking it up. <laughs> Coming up on the program, Bank of America, they've got a call year-end on the S&P of 4,600 for next year, just 4,600. The high on the street, 53. The low, 44. We'll talk about the spread at the S&P 500 guesses for next year in just a moment from New York. This is Bloomberg.
just how sensitive the markets are to any commentary about trade. We did see some pressure on the yuan. We did see some pressure on the futures. That is now being reversed. Bloomberg has enhanced search on the terminal to deliver what you need when you need it. Now, you can simply type phrases in everyday English in the command line. Compare financials. Find people. Analyze markets. You can enter phrases or ask questions. What do you want to know today? Ask a question or visit SearchGo to find answers now. The messaging from the curve is very, very pessimistic. There's a lot of what's going on in the market now that is pure risk management. I hope someday again in my career, we focus on valuations over hopes, dreams, themes, and memes. I don't think this is the time to chase deep value. For now, corporate profitability looks pretty good. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrow, Lisa Bramitz, and Tom Keen. Jobs Day on radio and television across America, around the world, and it is an Omicron Jobs Day. I'm sorry, John, the story changed with this new variant. You think we're Omicron dependent on December 15th, Tom? Does this data in 30 minutes matter for the Federal Reserve? Andrew Peckoff's John Hopkins University would say yes. He's working on it now. He lauded South Africa for their work, but he said, look, this is an America on the go. This is an America doing better. We're going to see that in the report today. What, John? 500,000 jobs created? 550. Normal 200,000? Oh, yeah, but I know. Come on. It's a boom economy, but there's Omicron to get in the way. 550, the estimate, Tom, and a belief that the Federal Reserve is ready to go <clears throat> to speed up that taper. You see at the front end of the yield curve that maybe we start to have a conversation about higher interest well, rates through the yield curve, Tom. we got a flatter curve this week. we got to go to the data check right now, John. And we'll, let's do this with one statistic. The vanilla spread, the difference in yield between the 10-year and the 2-year, 79.443. That's a telling statistic. And that is how we ended the year last year. Tom, just a total round trip on the yield curve, the spread between 2s and 10s. We were talking about hopes, dreams, and memes. Wasn't that how we opened this hour, nice. Tom? Hopes, Very dreams, good. and memes. Hopes well, the hopes and dreams of Q1 21. They are gone, Tom. Lisa, they are gone. Lisa, save us here. On Jobs Day, it's a stew of opinion. It's a stew in the zeitgeist, but mostly it's a stew between a political America and a financial boom economy. And a Federal Reserve that perhaps is responding to the political reality of inflation. How much has the conversation at the Fed shifted away from the jobs report? Will this labor market report even be as important as some of the previous ones <clears throat> to the market response, given the fact that inflation seems seems to be, have taken the forefront in the Fed's consideration. Let's get to the data now. This guest that we have coming up, Savita Subramanian, Bank of America, too important. To, to, we got to get to every second we can with her. John, I'm looking at green on the screen. The VIX goes from a 28 level, that 30 level of two days ago, down to 27.19. The future's positive on the S&P, Tom, five on the S&P, up a tenth of 1%. On the NASDAQ, up 30. The NASDAQ, 100, up two tenths. Looking ahead to next year, Tom, the high estimate for year end next year, 5,300, the low 40. For Bank of America at 4,600 year end 2022. Lots of nuances here, and I note in Europe with a German announcement on vaccination, Swiss francs stronger, 20 year Swiss piece, negative 0.186. John, the real yield today, it's going to be fascinating to see where you are on that uh, after this jobs report. The real yield now, negative 1.06. That's the conversation we've had all morning, Tom, when it comes to that, how deeply negative rates are in real terms in America versus where inflation is, versus where nominal growth Those is are. as well. We haven't been here before, Tom. That's what Alan Ruskin of Deutsche Bank was talking about earlier this week. And the big conversation about rates is not liftoff. It's about where we end. How far does the Fed have to push right. it to even tighten? And where we end, folks, is at the x-axis. Savita Subramanian doing mathematics at Berkeley is very aware of the x-axis. And brilliantly, in her cautious report for Bank of America, she looks at the sequence from taper to tighten to Tina. What happens to Tina if there's no alternative, Tina, if we get the first two? 
Yeah, I think that Tina is in peril and she needs to be careful because here we are in an environment where their dividend yield on the S&P 500 is below where cash yields are likely to be in a year or two. So, you know, all of a sudden cash looks really attractive in an environment where our economists are, are forecasting, you know, eight hikes over the next couple of years. I think that's an environment where you want to own free cash flow, but you don't necessarily want, want to own the entire S&P 500. So I think we're in an environment where it gets tricky. You're seeing volatility. I think this negative real rates environment is really interesting because we're now just accepting this as normal. And this reminds me of 2000 when we all accepted a negative equity risk premium as normal. This is not normal. Negative real rates are abnormal. And I think that they're telling us that something is essentially wrong and we need to see some sort of correction in, um, at, at the very least, bonds to get us back to a, a, a more normal setting. So, so I don't know. I look at a lot of the statistics right now and it looks very similar to 2000 from a, a you know, valuation, expectation, euphoria perspective. And then it also looks pretty similar to the late 70s where, you know, or the, the I guess the mid 70s where folks are, are really not prepared for the types of inflationary shocks that, uh, or the, the sustained inflation cycle that we're likely to see. Savita, those comparisons make things sound really scary, but a lot of people would point out the big heavyweights on the S&P 500 are minting money, delivering massive growth. What would you say back to the people to bring that up. Sure. So here's what I would say. I agree. And I think the bubble right now is not in stocks. It's in bonds. And that's what we have to do from a stock perspective is figure out which stocks are going to be hurt by rising interest rates, by, um, you know, rising equity risk premia. I mean, you're seeing really funky stuff happen in the markets right now. And I use that as a technical term. <laughs> but um, if you look at, you know, for example, the, the, the treasury market, the, one of the biggest markets in the <clears throat> world, is starting to show signs of liquidity risk. We're seeing, you know, China real estate, which is literally the largest asset class in the world, starting to fray. So I think these are the areas where we're more likely to see the pain. I mean, from a U.S. equity perspective, you're right. Mega cap tech still looks pretty good. But the problem is everybody owns it. And if we're in an environment where volatility starts to creep up and we have to rebalance, I think that the S&P is going to be one of the risk asset classes that sees the most selling. Savina, and that's, again, where I worry about downside. What's going to pop the bubble that you see in bonds if even the prospect of faster rate hikes from the Federal Reserve has not done it? Well, here's where I think it gets interesting. Because if you look at what popped the bubble in stocks in, in prior cycles, it was a very similar landscape to what we're setting up for now. We had a Fed starting to tighten into a statistically overvalued market. I mean, that's what we saw in 2000. That's what we saw in a couple of prior market peaks. We had inflation expectations um, lower than where I actually think inflation is going to be over the next couple of years. And we had an environment where I think, you know, asset allocators were very bullish on stocks. So, I mean, one of the, the, the area similarities between today and prior the prior three market peaks is that we saw asset allocators like the Wall Street, Wall Street uh, sell side strategists increase their allocations to stocks by about you know seven percentage points heading into that uh, that market peak that's exactly where we are now so you know as as Tom said I like to look at the numbers and a lot of numbers are rhyming with with market peaks in prior cycles they might Same be story for negative real rates Sorry, go ahead. No, but, but the, they're rhyming, and this gets to the negative real rate discussion. They're rhyming, but it's a different circumstance with a Federal Reserve that has shown a greater willingness to step in if there is market turmoil. A lot of people are saying, don't fight the Fed, don't fe fight the Fed's put. Do you think that that's overplayed, that they're not going to come in uh, in the face of turmoil? Well, look, I think that, you know, they're going to try to fix everything, but the Fed has tried to create an inflation cycle for 10 years. Uh, who's to say they're going to be able to keep it under control? Um, you know, I think that, that the Fed is certainly not in a position where they want to royal markets and, and scare investors. Mm -hmm. But I just wonder, you know, do they have the tools to, uh, to essentially accommodate an environment where 
Inflation is starting to rise. Economic activity is, is building, and that's positive for the economy. But, you know, we're starting to see labor inflation really creep into margins. I mean, this is an environment where I don't know <coughs> if the Fed's going to be able to quell uh, market volatility. I mean, the other thing that I think is interesting is that right now we're in an environment where our rate strategists are forecasting pretty uh, a pretty big pickup in rates volatility. So we're more likely to see rates volatility. We're more likely to see equity market volatility. This is a different environment than what we've enjoyed over the last couple of years or even the last decade. And in that environment, the number one factor that we need to care about is the cost of equity capital. If volatility rises, the equity risk premium increases, and that's basically game over for a lot of these longer duration stocks and companies that have thrived on a, a falling cost of capital. So, you know, I don't want to sound too alarmist, and I think, you know, we're not looking for massive downside, big bear market, but I do think the probability of a 10% correction in the, in the near term or, you know, over the next 12 months is elevated, and our market forecast is flat. We're not looking for down market returns, but over the next yeah. 12 months, I think it's going to be a tough grind. Zavita, before we let you go, I've got to get this question in. My approach to this job, as you know, has always been to respect the forecast because the forecast, by definition, can be not be wrong. It's a forecast. But when you look back at this year, <laughs> your forecast ultimately fell short of where this market was. And Zavita, I just wonder, the lesson of this year, what has it been for you and the team as we look back at this year and look ahead to 22? Yeah, so I think the lesson this year for me was don't underestimate corporate America. This is why, you know, I think if I'm wrong next year, it'll be because corporates managed to keep margins intact. I think the lesson for me is that in a long duration market environment, if interest rates and the cost of capital falls, that's super bullish for stocks. And that's not something that we were penciling in at the beginning of the year was a falling equity risk premium. So it's pretty shocking, a lot of the trends that we saw this year. And then I think negative real rates, like the, the fact that we're now four forecasting negative real rates, you know, that's not something that I, I thought was going to be in the, you know, in the landscape of, of, of realistic assumptions. Savita, you know, we have a ton of respect for you and the team. Thank you for being with us. <laughs> looking back you. on this year and looking ahead, Tom, to next year, some really firm calls coming from Bank of America, looking ahead to 22. Well, they're new us. Let's not forget Francisco Blanche walking up to $100 a barrel. That gets your attention. It gets my attention, too. 8.30 Eastern, your payrolls report. That payrolls report, 20 minutes away from New York City. This is Bloomberg. With the first news, I'm Rishka Gupta. Traders are waiting to see if the November jobs report is as strong as surveys forecast. According to the median estimate of a Bloomberg poll of economists, employers added 550,000 jobs last month and the unemployment rate fell to 4.5%. The figures could shape expectations for the pace of Fed policy tightening. We'll have the jobs report at 8.30 a.m. New York time. Congress has averted a U.S. government shutdown on Thursday night. The Senate passed a stopgap spending bill and sent it to President Biden for his signature. The bill will pay for government operations through February the 18th. Without the measure, the government would have been forced into a partial shutdown after midnight Friday. And in New York, dozens of hospitals are nearing capacity as the state reported the most new coronavirus cases since January. More than 11,000 cases were recorded. At least five cases of the Omicron variant have been found. And 56 hospitals in New York had bed capacity of 10% or less. Today, state officials will be allowed to limit non-essential hospital procedures. And Elon Musk keeps advancing towards his goal of selling 10% of his stake in Tesla, according to a filing the world's Richest person offloaded another billion dollars worth of shares in the electric car maker. The sales were to help him offset taxes on the exercise of stock options. Musk has now sold about 10 million of the 17 million shares he'd need to reach the 10% threshold. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Rishka Gupta. This is Bloomberg.
access the financial world on demand. Hear from leading economists, policymakers, and industry experts via live and on-demand webinars only from Bloomberg. Start exploring to see what's moving the markets. Visit Bloomberg.com webinars. Up front, when your shares are down 20%, it's going to hurt. But talk to us about, well, really what you're seeing. What, take us more forward looking. Are you worried about people exiting pandemic era and going back to the gym? Or, or are we going to work out at home more? Well, that's actually um, the advantage that Beachbody has is we have never been uh, a direct competitor with the gym. In fact, what we rely on is our ability to influence the 150 million people in North America specifically who are overweight or obese and haven't made that choice yet. Our job is to influence them with great content and this combination of what we call the total solution, fitness, nutrition, and community so that they can tap into this incredibly cost-effective solution that is entertaining and engaging right at home so that they get results. That's our job, is to help the new person engage in healthy lifestyles. supply chain are you starting to see things improve and if you are where specifically sir well this year we have been mostly affected by the semiconductor situation and uh, uh, we believe that the quarter three uh, was the quarter that was most effective I think what we've seen during this period of time is that communicating via video is not a fad that we are using it in all aspects of our lives for work for learning, for communicating, for staying in touch. This is a market that over the past few weeks has made it clear it wants to go higher. It got a little spooked by the idea that geopolitical potentials are rising. rapid recovery and we're very far along towards full employment with the Fed still doing QE and paying short-term interest rates at zero. That is a policy that will cement uh, a more permanent inflationary backdrop in place uh, if policy doesn't adjust. And the Fed seems to get it. That policy set to adjust December 15th, that Federal Reserve next meeting. Before we get there, payrolls this morning. They're 12 minutes away. Inflation data at some point next week, to the back end of next week. Going into payrolls, 12 minutes away. Futures near session highs, just off them. Positive two-tenths of a 1% on the S&P. Yields come in a couple of basis points on a 10-year to 142.23. And just hearing from <coughs> South Africa's National Institute for Diseases, Tom, just getting some early data on things. So I'm going to read it out verbatim, and you can draw your own conclusions. In the early third wave, 66.1% of admissions were severe. In the early fourth wave, that number, Tom, is 32.9% of admissions are severe. There is a huge focus on the Omicron variant, Tom, and we're all waiting for a fuller picture of things. So this is an early take <coughs> by South yeah. Africa's National Institute of Disease. 66.1% of admissions were severe in the early third wave. In the early point of this wave, Tom, the number is 32.9%. And qu quickly, John, to get to our two good guests here, uh, you know, I, I don't see South African RAND really moving on this, but I would suggest somewhat off this news, we saw a continuing flattening here with the two-year yield in America, a higher yield, which is sort of a sigh of relief move. I, yeah, I don't want to I don't know, I Tom. be careful. I don't want Mark to market this story every time this data comes yeah. out. I want to go back to the process, and the process for all of us is as follows. How contagious is the disease? How severe is it? And how well do vaccines stand up to it? In the early part of this story, we haven't had much data at all. To get a full, full picture <laughs> of this, we might have to wait another couple of weeks. But early indications, Tom, indicate everywhere we look at the moment, 
that the cases have been quite mild. And what we're hearing from South Africa this morning backs that up. Though, as I say, Tom, and I keep <coughs> repeating this, you do too, I'll stress it again, it's early days. We need yeah. more data. <clears throat> Right now, we're going to do the jobs report. Michael McKee to join us here in a moment to get us set up for this really interesting December report. James Glassman joins us. He's head economist, J.P. Morgan Chase Commercial Banking. And, and what's so important and well-timed, Jim, and having you on is Savita Subramanian of Bank of America was just on with a cautious view for 2021. And John was gracious and said, you know, where were you a bit off the mark? And she quoted Glassman 101 which is corporations adjusted. You're the king of this. How are corporations adjusting into 2022? They've done an amazing job because they had to. They had to survive, right? And so they've learned how to go, how to do it the Amazon way, which is you know, got to learn how to get on the digital channels and reach customers. And the guys who, the guys who did that really did quite well. And it's really amazing when on the surface, when you look at the U.S. economy, National output is back to where we would have been had there been no pandemic, but we're doing it with a lot fewer people, uh, which is which is why I think the Fed is hopeful that we're going to pull all these people back in and we can manage uh, above trend growth for another year and and not run into the inflation problems. With That's going to be the interesting yeah, thing. With all your commercial relations, Jim, and the decades of work you've had across America, are corporations managing for the next quarter, or do you actually see anyone developing a three-year business plan? There's a lot of that discussion going on. People are asking, if we're going to be dealing with supply chain problems, should we be reshoring some of this work? Well, some of it is going to Mexico. I've seen some of that when I'm down in El Paso. But, you know, on the other hand, what they're realizing is that it's harder and harder to find people. You're having to pay more for workers. Which of those two phenomena are going to be more lasting? I think people are, I think most people are saying, let's sit and watch. But that's really, Tom, what people are looking at. They're trying to figure out where is this going over the next several years? Everybody knows all kinds of people right now. And they're dealing with price pressures and all that. But I think that is the, that is the number one question for folks because uh, they, they're, they're, and the, they're thinking they got to do, be thinking more about automation yeah. um, and rethinking where they should be locating a lot of this stuff. It, I think, I think most people realize that these bottlenecks we've got at the LA ports and, and the trucking channels, they're not going to go on forever. We're going to get through them. And then you're going to ask, what's the more lasting impact, higher cost of labor or more of the kind of congestion we're getting. So we've got about eight minutes until the payrolls report. What's the most interesting aspect of it to you? Is it the headline number? Is it the wage increases that we see? Or is it labor participation? I think now the issue is becoming more labor participation because we've done a pretty good job getting back to where we once belong. We got unemployment almost down. Officially, on the surface, it looks like unemployment is kind of back to where we were before. And now the issue is, what about those 4 million people who kind of dropped out last year, which is the reason why you're seeing so many help wanted signs. Are they going to be coming back in? And if they are, I mean, the Fed, it's, it, the Fed wants to normalize its policies, but they're going to be a little more cautious if they see signs that more and more people are coming back in, because we're not really quite there. Jim, we've got to leave that. Is, We've yep. got to run. It's got to catch up, sir, ahead of payrolls, as we always do. Jim Glassman of J.P. Yes. Morgan, Chase Commercial Bank. And we have to leave it there because Tom Keane, drum roll, Mike McKee made the ring walk. We need to record that ring walk as Mike McKee enters the studio. Mike McKee looking ahead he to does. payrolls data just a few minutes away. Give us the guide, Mike. What are you looking for? Well, we are looking for something in the range of the consensus 550,000, the whisper number on Wall Street, only a tick higher than that, although the entire street kind of leans that direction, I think, at this point. This is going to be a checklist for the Fed uh, report rather than anything that is decisive. If we get something, uh, what people are, are more or less expecting for jobs, uh, unemployment, and for labor force participation, the Fed can just say, you know, check, yeah. we're done, and move on to uh, increasing the speed of the taper. In the 47 pages you read and nobody else reads, Mike, there'll be a paragraph on holiday employment, Amazon hiring 4 million people. Hello, traders. How are you doing today? I'm going to place in order to buy uh, British pound and the price I'm looking to buy, 132.72. Okay, 132.72, this is the price I'm looking to buy. 
British pound. All of you guys who hold our uh, strategy and follow following my trades, please do so. Please place uh, your order to buy British pound. Other people who just enjoy this channel, uh, you're welcome to watch and to see how we trade uh, Forex. Okay? I'll speak to you later, guys. And this really goes to the hourly employment. Just real quick here, what's the whisper out there? We're seeing 5% as the estimate uh, globally in terms of the year-over-year -year wage increase. What do you think it is uh, potentially going to be? Uh, that's probably as good an estimate as any. That would imply a four-tenths percent increase on the month, which is about what we have been seeing. The Fed would like to see that continue to rise, but maybe not at that rate. And if we are getting more people into the labor force, that'll take some of the pressure off it. It's all things they've got to consider. They've got to put all this together and uh, make sense out of it. Mike McKee, sit tight. We're four minutes and about 15 seconds away from the payrolls report in America. Full reaction with Mike McKee, Jeff Rosenberg of BlackRock, looking forward to that 550 is your median estimate the number comes next from new york this is bloomberg is that we create some uh, icons, we call them tags, and they have a like a, a signal within them. Uh, and when you stare at that, your eye responds to it in a particular way. So the way in which that eye response occurs is a signal that we pick up on the visual cortex of the brain at the back of the brain. So the sensor is looking for the signals we create here that come through the eyeball, through the brain, and then onto the visual cortex. Once we've got it there as a signal, we can grab that, we understand what that signal looks like, and we can turn that into a command for whatever we're trying to control. There's multiple places where we think this technology can be applied, perhaps in, I don't know, uh, driving or commanding uh, unmanned uh, ground vehicles or unmanned uh, naval vessels perhaps um, providing uh, menu selection and control within a, a control room environment, maybe in a nuclear power station, all those kind of things are perhaps in the bailiwick of this technology. People are talking about Bloomberg surveillance. There's some guy out on Twitter who says, I look like I'm on. I know, I know, sir. Do you think I need a lift? Is it time what that I... say about me? What did that particular gentleman what? say about? Let's have a look. Oh, One of life. them is near 101 years but of age. Which one would that be? The other has an ego in the orbit of Mars. <laughs> Who's that? <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> Mrs. Lisa, the only chance to productive conversation. It's a fairly accurate summary of this show, isn't it, Tom? <laughs> the eyes, or should I do the whole thing? How will pricing have to adjust or not as a result of your greener ambitions? We ran a big uh, survey around 32 countries, more than 30,000 people took part. And as you say, there was a big gap in between, between people that were worried about climate and people that were taking action. Well, as you can see, guys, we need to cancel the order because it moved rapidly higher. <laughs> um, 
Okay, guys, um, then please cancel your order because right now you don't know what's going to happen and I thought it will be quick profit. No, it won't be. Uh, nothing so simple and easy in this life. I'll speak to you later, guys. So uh, please cancel your order and uh, stay with me. Stay safe. Seconds away from the payrolls report. Futures up nine on the S&P, advancing two tenths of one percent. Eight thirty Eastern with your numbers. Let's get to Mike McKee. Good morning, Michael McKee. Good morning, John. The uh, change in non-farm payrolls comes in only half the level we anticipated. 210,000. That's a real surprise. And that is going to cause some head scratching at the Fed. What do we do about that? Uh, the unemployment rate, though, dropped significantly 4.2 percent, uh, down from 4.6 percent. Uh, let me quickly check here because I suspect that the civilian labor force, uh, it did rise by 594,000 people. So a lot of people going back into the labor force. Uh, the household survey shows over a million jobs, 1.1 million uh, employed, where unemployment drops by 542,000. So you've got a good news story on the unemployment rate, but it doesn't match up with what's going on in the establishment survey. Again, two Average hourly earnings come in lighter, three-tenths of a percent, down from four-tenths. And uh, the average weekly hours is at 34.8. Now, the one everybody wants to see is the labor force participation rate. And as you can imagine from the numbers I gave you for the labor force, it does tick up significantly to 61.8 from 61.6. The uh, estimation was in the middle of that, 61.7. Uh, the net payroll revisions for the month, and then I'll let you check the markets here, uh, September revised up by 67,000 to 379,000, and October by 15,000 to 546,000. So uh, a revision higher in the previous two months, but not the kind of uh, revisions that we saw in the prior month. Early days, Mike, always is. Early days and a knee-jerk reaction in this market. This is how we price this market off the back of these numbers. A downside surprise on the headline number. Equity futures out higher to session highs, positive about 19, 20 points, up four-tenths of 1%. But just look at the yield curve now. This bid yeah. snaps into the belly of the curve. Five-year yields come in four basis <clears throat> points. Your two-year in about one. The long end in about the same amount, down a basis point. But the big rally here is through the front end into the belly of the curve, Tom, through to tens. Yields yeah. rallying there. As I imagine, we're adjusting the rate height debate a little bit, but I just don't want to draw conclusions off the back of this too much, Tom. Big downside miss on a headline number. Low estimate was 375. Medium was 550. High was 800. Actual was 210. But when you look at the unemployment rate, Tom, and participation. It's a really interesting yeah, labor market I, I, report outside of that headline number. We're going to have to really readjust on this. NASDAQ uh, 100, uh, picking it up here, eight-tenths of a percent with a very nice lift. Mike, you mentioned this as a pro, and I think this is a concept that people flunk in Econ 101. You just said the labor force went up, but non-farm payrolls disappointed. Most of our listeners and viewers are saying, huh? How yeah. is that? Well, uh, that's why you guys are going to have uh, some semi-professional economists on later on the show to explain it, because I can't explain it off the top of my head yet. Um, it, it, the two surveys diver diverge tremendously, the household and the uh, establishment surveys, and it's kind of hard to know why, if that many people were out looking for work with that many job openings, they didn't get the jobs. Let me pass on some other news, though, that will bear on what the Fed does. Remember, Jay Powell has made it clear they're looking to improve the unemployment rates for minorities, and boy, did they improve. The black unemployment rate falls to 6.7 percent from 7.9 percent. That's 1.2 percentage points lower. The Hispanic uh, uh, unemployment rate falls to 5.2 percent from 5.9 percent. So significant progress there. If you were looking at this report, just uh, in terms of what the Fed said, and you left out the headline number, you'd well, say, this guarantees a faster <clears throat> taper, they're reaching their goals. Uh, the question right. is, what happened to the Jed, people getting jobs? We're starting to see a market reaction here. I don't care what anybody says. We're starting to really see this piece together within the mystery, as McKee says, of two separate labor reports. And I'm sorry, you've got an equity market lift. You've got a lift, Tom. We're up four-tenths on the S&P, on a NASDAQ up six-tenths of 1%. The focus quickly went to the yield curve, Lisa, to the belly of the curve, where we had a rally, but we've given some of that up now already. Off the back of the headline number, there was Mike McKee stresses, Lisa, it's important. If you stripped out the 210 and you looked at unemployment and you looked at participation, 
It's a fairly decent report, isn't it? It's a terrific report. A 4.2% unemployment rate puts us back to February 2020 in terms of how low the jobless rate really is. If you look at participation, people are coming back in. And this comes as the Fed stresses inflation and de-emphasizes, uh, to some people at least, the employment report. I mean, honestly, Michael, just to wrap things up here, isn't this, in the Fed's eyes, a very good report? It seems to be a very good report. I'm looking now to try to figure out where the holes in the report are. Um, we see professional and business services adding 90,000. That would include the uh, the people who come on for temporary jobs, and that's usually a sign that we're going to see uh, further employment uh, going forward. Uh, we talked, Tom, about the uh, the transportation and warehousing, the couriers. Mm, couriers. That was up by 50,000, 210,000 above its February 2020 level. So that area has no. completely recovered. 31,000 for construction, manufacturing, 31,000. Uh, so we are seeing strength in some of the places that we thought we would. Where we didn't see strength is leisure and hospitality, uh, up 23,000. That's not a huge gain compared to uh, how low they have been. And uh, employment, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, in leisure and hospitality is down by 1.3 million still. And I'm wondering if part of the problem is people are coming back into the labor force and the jobs that they are qualified for don't exist. Maybe Mike McKee. Uh, restaurants and bars going out of business. We've got a lot of questions about this one, Mike. Thank you, sir. Often with payrolls, the first move is not the move that sticks, and that might be true of what's happening in the front end of the curve right now. There was a rally that came in, twos out to the belly of the curve, off the back of that headline miss. Tom, we're giving some of that up now, because to Mike's point, when you get away from the headline number, there's not much here to steer the Fed away from what they've discussed all week when they get together on December 15th. Yeah, and this really emphasizes to me, John, they're just going to wait for more data with two dis d d uh, different reports there. And a lot of people will parse this, including Jeffrey Rosenberg, portfolio manager of Systematic Multi-Strategy Fund at BlackRock. Jeffrey, uh, when you get ambiguity like this, what do you do? Well, it's a really interesting report. I think you guys have broken it down uh, well that it, it may not be so ambiguous when you when you look behind the headline. The headline is the disappointment on 210, but as Mike McKee just went through, a lot of that looks like seasonality and the impact of seasonal flows coming in lower than what the seasonal factors would otherwise expect. And so you get some disappointment on the headline. As Jonathan just went through, the initial market reaction is all the machines looking at that headline number. Give it a minute and you look at what Lisa talked about, which I think is the much stronger message here, the decline in those unemployment rates, the impact of labor force participation finally coming back. This is the strength of the underlying labor market that is speaking here. And I think when you look at the market reaction kind of fading that initial disappointment is spot on. And that's really the bigger message. And Tom, to your last point, I don't think this report really changes anything from the from the Fed with regards to the labor market. But it is obviously the cross currents between the headline and the underlying components. I think the underlying components here are much stronger. Stronger. Jeff, we've got to talk about the Fed. When they get together on the 15th, it's not just about the taper conversation. Let's discuss their forecasts. Year end next year, they've got unemployment at 3.8%. <laughs> Jeff, we're almost there. We're at 42 How much of an adjustment do we need to see in a couple of weeks? Yeah, we could certainly see the adjustments come down, uh, you know, as they keep pace with how rapidly the labor market is is improving. I, I think they're closer on the on the jobs front than the other forecast, which is of of course the big topic, which is their their inflation forecast. And I and I think that's going to be the, the the driver into December fifteenth. And of course, you know, the other big story, the elephant in the room here, is that this report. You know, it doesn't have any of the COVID, any of the o Omicron issues that we still have in front of us. So over the next 10 days, we're going to find out a lot more. That's going to drive that debate into the Fed meeting uh, on the 15th. Jeff, I would agree with you that the underlying components are much more interesting and point to a very strong uh, report aside from that headline miss. I am, though, confused by average hourly earnings and how much we're seeing wages increase. That was a disappointment. And to me, it actually fell in terms of the pace of wage rises uh, from month to month. What do you make of that? Yeah, it, it's hard exactly to, to know what's going on there. A lot of the month-to-month -month variability, Lisa, is 
confusing by, based on the shift in the underlying mix of who's coming in, who's coming out. So when you look at average hourly earnings as opposed to other measures like employment cost index, uh, what you end up seeing is you know, a measurement of two things. What's the change in who's coming in and out and what's the change in what they're getting paid. And so when you have more lower wage workers entering the pool, <coughs> relative to higher wage workers, it can push down what you see in average hourly earnings, even if what we think of as kind of a fixed pool of workers, wages are going up. The message on those fixed pool uh, metrics have been for a while now clear that we're seeing pricing power come back to wages. And I don't think this disappointment on average hourly earnings should be overly interpreted as, as kind of challenging that story. I think it's still a strong labor market with strong labor market pricing and wage inflation. 50 minutes away from the up and in power state side. Futures up 18, up four tenths of 1% on the NASDAQ. NASDAQ 100 futures up six tenths of 1%. Counting down to the up and in power, we'll be catching up with Mohammed Al Arian, Rick Reader, Mike Collins, and Anastasia Amoroso, Tom to really break down this jobs report and get first reaction as well from the White House in about 50 minutes' time. You no, know, the reaction as well of a market lifting up. I note the NASDAQ uh, 100 after all this up six-tenths of a percent. And the VIX is a key statistic for me, really escaping the 30 and 28 level into 26.18. Again, Jeffrey Rosenberg with us uh, with BlackRock. Jeff, I, I want to talk about systematic and your responsibilities at BlackRock and I don't want to care about, I don't care about systematic to 1231 or even out into January. How are you managing and allocating capital out to the middle of next year, say the July 28th Fed meeting? Yeah, this is, this is a really good question, Tom, because what we're really debating is, you know, the bigger picture away from today's report is the Fed is talking about accelerating the pace of tapering, which is so that they can accelerate the pace of tightening. Uh, and, you know, markets have priced that in, so, so a lot of that change is with us. The bigger change that we all have to contemplate is the impact on real interest rates. You've had a spectacular level of support for asset inflation across all markets, whether they be financial markets or otherwise, from exceptionally low levels of real interest rates. And the Fed is basically saying it's time to change that outlook. So we should expect a very different financial market outlook in an environment where Fed policy is reacting to the exceptionally accommodative uh, uh, settings of negative real interest rates. And so that challenges a lot of uh, investment returns that we've seen, investment portfolio uh, strategies. And, and so we're looking at, you know, where are their vulnerabilities and where are their opportunities in a rising real rate environment? I just want to point out that as we speak and as traders parse through this report, two-year Treasury yields have turned positive or turned positive on the day, I should say. Uh, once again, 0.6171%. People assessing the underlying components here and seeing a very strong report. Jeff, with respect to Fed hiking, how many rate hikes can this market withstand and not be disrupted from a risk asset performance perspective? Really great question, because look at what the bond market is telling you with this massive curve flattening, right? So it's a very clear message from the bond market that it can't withstand that much increases. So what you see priced into bond markets is an expectation that the Fed is going to do what they're telling you, increase the pace of, of rate increases. We've priced in from one hike in 2022 to two hikes. So it's not a super aggressive increase. And when you look further out, you see that that pace of pricing in of interest rates by the Fed starts to fade relative to the Fed's dot plots. And that is reflective of the expectations that the market financial market conditions tightening, the impact of rising real interest rates just can't handle as much of a normalization of interest rates as the kind of full trajectory of Fed normalization and the dot plots otherwise would say. And that flattening of the yield curve, you know, is a message that we should pay attention to. It's basically saying as you move into an aggressive Fed tightening policy that the impact is going to slow the economy, tighten financial conditions, 
and is a is a is a a, a warning of a recessionary <laughs> right. indicator. Whether the Fed goes there, we'll see. But that's what the bond market is saying. Okay, I, I agree. The bond market's saying that. But very quickly, or Jeff Rosenberg, as we move on to the equity markets, the ambiguity of today's report does it change the path or the the belief, the cadence of taper to tighten? I don't think it. I don't think it does. I, I think that, and as Lisa just highlighted, you know, the turnaround in the two years. I think the market figuring out that this isn't uh, gonna. This yeah. is not a disappointing a payroll <laughs> report yeah. that takes the Fed out. So I think the pace is as the market. The narrative is is still the same, pricing in the acceleration. <laughs> now, how far the market gets ahead of the Fed, or whether the market can push the Fed to go even further than that, is kind of the next right. phase. You know, we priced in basically, you know, two hikes in 2022, accelerating that first hike to June or July of next year. You know, will will we get more? I think we're going to have to see more data, mm -hmm. more worries from the Fed on inflation and a willingness to be more aggressive uh, before All we right. get there. Jeff Rosenberg, thank you so much for the treatment this morning on this jobs thank report. You. Lisa Bramwitz and Tom Keen, uh, we welcome all of you on radio and television uh, across this nation. An ambiguous jobs report, that according to Michael McKee. And always unambiguous, Gina Martin-Adams joins us now, Chief Equity Strategist, Bloomberg Intelligence, on these equity markets. What I see, Gina, is the sweat of the week, the Omicron fear with a VIX of 30, a touch, and we're back down already to 26.24 in 1.71 big VIX points this morning. Is this another vote that corporations will adapt and we need to own shares? Well, I think it's all in, in perspective, right? A VIX at 26 is usually affiliated with a market meltdown. I mean, normally when we have a VIX above 20, we're in a period of massive correction in markets. But considering where we've been, where the VIX was at an all-time high back in March 2020, we're still seeing the VIX correct. We're still seeing volatility sort of normalize uh, over the longer haul. I do think the market is increasingly comfortable that the economy has finally reached escape velocity. That's part of the 2021 story is we do feel a lot more comfortable that we are going to see more persistent, more consistent economic growth going forward. The big question now is not necessarily how does the economy react to the variant, which has certainly created some short-term volatility, but really what is the Fed going to do? How fast is the Fed going to tighten? What is that going to do to rates? And how will rates then have a snowball effect on valuations in the equity market? Because we have seen valuations accelerate precipitously over the course of the last couple of years, reflecting that extremely easy policy, very, very low level of interest rates and very steep yield curve. So I do think going into 2022, it's more about rates. While we get a little bit more comfortable that economic growth may be choppy, certainly slowing from the pace at the start of the recovery, but very consistent still into expansion from recovery. All right, Gina, given the fact that we now are pricing in two rate hikes for next year, and it seems like this labor market report has not derailed those expectations, has the equity market priced that in, or are they just sort of in a wait and see mode, hoping that maybe uh, it won't be as significant as the market's pricing in on the bond side? Yeah, so it's more than just rates. I think the equity market, frankly, is looking more exclusively at what's happening with the balance sheet first. And this is really consistent with the experience of the, light, the last cycle. There are several stages of Fed tightening that we've got to go through. The first is we had to contend with the idea that, okay, the taper is coming. That was part of what we experienced in the September correction. Now we're going through the process of the taper may be faster than we had expected into 2022. That's part of the second correction. We have yet to get to the point where the balance sheet stops rising, which is critical for the equity market because that's the point of greatest risk historically. We still have a period of liquidity provision coming, and I think that this is missing from the conversation. A taper does not mean the Fed is taking away the punch bowl. It just means they're filling it less quickly going into 2022. So that is supportive to equity market valuations as long as the bond market doesn't react in a vicious manner. Coming midway through 2022, we get to our most critical point in time when the taper ends and we start to see rate hikes. 
I don't think the equity market is thinking much about the rate hike scenario, given we've got so many steps to go through in the interim. Meanwhile, markets are discounting mechanism, which is why you really emphasize the unknown of the bond market reaction. I'd love to get your take on what Bank of America's Savita Subramanian was saying, that basically at a certain point, if we start pricing in three, four rate hikes in the next couple of years, cash starts to look like a very good alternative to the dividend yield on the S&P 500. Is that a compelling argument against uh, the move much higher in the index? I think it will create a bit of rotation in the index, certainly, because you start to see a very different economic environment if investors are starting to rotate out of equities. I think, frankly, that's a long way from where we are today and certainly not going to drive stocks in the next six to even maybe 12 months. You know, the dividend yield on the S&P 500, albeit still around 2%, still a far cry from where we are on the short end of the curve. Uh, so I would say it's a bit of a stretch to suggest that we're going to price that in imminently. It may be something we contend with at the end of 2022, early 2023, as we're looking into 2024, 2025. Mm -hmm. But it's just not the story for me for early 2022. Gina, thank you so much. Look forward to the publishing of Bloomberg Intelligence over the weekend and into next week. Gina Martin-Adams running our equity shop. Michael McKee, during all of this, not listening to Gina Martin-Adams. He's buried in the 40, 50 pages of data. What's beneath the headline data, Mike? Well, I think the biggest thing is probably a seasonal adjustment factor, and we're seeing a number of analysts point to that. The total number of non-farm jobs on a non-seasonally adjusted basis was 778,000. So we lost about 500, half a million uh, jobs, 500,000 jobs uh, to the seasonal adjustment factors in the month. Uh, Neil Dutta from Renaissance Macro points out that the Fed's uh, summer, survey of economic projections, summary of economic projections, right. is based <clears throat> on the unemployment rate and not the total number of non farm payroll jobs. So the Fed is going to be looking at the unemployment rate and the figures underneath that that I pointed out uh, yeah. for good news. And I also looked, uh, because of course, uh, health care is big in the Keene family. This is, I guess, a surprise or not a surprise, but hospitals lost 3,900 jobs during the month. And we've heard a lot about nursing burnout and right. uh, doctor burnout. And I'm wondering if Right, uh, right. That's a seasonal thing, or if there's a real uh, loss now, of jobs in that category. Interesting. One more question, Mike, before we get to Ira Jersey and and the bond reaction here. Seasonal adjustment. People like flunk economic exams over that. With all of your research over these years, do you have belief in the validity of seasonal adjustment, given the shock of this pandemic to this nation? Well, that's sort of two different questions. Yes, I believe in the validity of seasonal adjustment, but I think it's got to be very hard to do now to do because right now. the yeah. numbers yeah. have been yeah. so wide that it's hard to compare anything. Right. They usually take five years' worth of seasonal numbers, but last year's numbers were so weird that yeah, uh, it's hard to do. To me, I, I, the math doesn't... I, I can't get there, Lisa. I just can't get there given a pandemic. I, when I hear 700,000 jobs are created, that floats my, my boat. Uh, the VIX are ne uh, down 1.53, 26.42. Futures up 12. Lisa? Yeah, and I'm looking right now at the front end of the yield curve. Basically, two-year yields rising to near the highs of the year, 0.631%. I am curious also about Michael McKee's idea about healthcare workers dropping out. I do wonder about the analyses of the vaccine management mandates and how that affected certain employment backdrops uh, in specific areas. Right now, though, let us really hone in here on the Federal Reserve reaction function on the bond market, which has seen that yield curve flattening persist despite uh, the, the uh, sort of momentary blip. Ira Jersey parsing through it all. Bloomberg Intelligence Chief U.S. Interest Rate Strategist. What was your first take from this report? Yeah, hey, Lisa, obviously that, that headline employment report, you know, that was why we had that knee-jerk reaction where you had five-year notes and and kind of the belly part of the curve, which uh, which is pricing for the Federal Reserve's terminal rate, so how high they'll ultimately hike interest rates during the cycle. That all rallied, but has since come back. And I think, you know, some of the things that Mike McKee and Jeff Rosenberg were talking about a little earlier, this report really was not that bad. So in, if I take in, in aggregate, look at aggregate labor income, which is the 
number of jobs created times the amount of, uh, of, of hours that each employee is working every week times hourly earnings, what you wind up seeing is we're back to the pre-COVID trend right now. So, um, so basically the economy and a lot of the things that we look at in the economy have returned back to 2000, um, uh, 2019-ish kind of levels. So because of that, th th that is a, a reason why the, I think the market's still thinking the Fed is going to taper a little bit faster. The market will probably price for earlier hikes even than what we're pricing right now. So we're still pricing a full hike in, in June of 2022. The question for me is, will that be realized? Because there's a lot of uncertainty still uh, in in the economy and with you know Omicron and everything else that that maybe you know you know the Fed while they might taper faster, they might not hike very much faster. Do you see a conflicting message, Ira, both in the market basically goading the Fed on to hike rates, basically the Fed adapting to the market's view, and this flattening yield curve, which seems to indicate, as some people have mentioned on the show today, a policy error. Yeah, it's kind of weird, uh, you know. So I think that that the chair getting hawkish over the last two weeks or so um, has really changed the the market vernacular and what the market's thinking about. So the market is thinking that hey, if the Federal Reserve hikes two or three times in 2022, they might only go one or two more times after that and then stop. Um, and I, I'm I'm less convinced of that. Mm -hmm. I do think that that personally that the Fed's reaction function, and I think you'll hear this at the December 15th meeting once again, is that the, um, the 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 threshold for taper is much different than the threshold for hikes. And even if they yeah. hike once, remember in 2015 everything was good. They hiked once in December. They didn't hike for another year after that. And uh, you know I, I suspect that we might only get like one hike every every six months for the first you know year oh. year and a half. Um, and then eventually we'll get into a more normal cadence and, and you know, rates will go up to like 2% in the Fed funds rate, in which case the market is certainly right. not priced for that. I, right I think you're just dead on in this. I just think, folks, this is so, so important to understand that the taper timeline is – and the delta of it, the amount of lift is radically different uh, than what we see with a rate uh, story to come. Ira, how do you parse – a global Wall Street that we speak to and listen to each and every day, where you've got one group saying, forget about transitory, and another group on the edge of Draghi pulling things out like Lagarde this morning into 22 and 23. How do you parse this weekend the dichotomy? Yeah, so, yeah, you know, it's everyone seems to have there is this binary camp right so it's either either you're in the transitory camp and think that we're going to get back to two and a half percent inflation in two or three years which by the way the market is still pricing um, or you think that inflation is going to remain significantly higher than it has been and I, I think the idea that we're going to have continued six or seven percent inflation as someone mentioned to me yesterday I, I think that that's very unlikely just because you have a lot of base effects that are going on but imagine a world where you're somewhere in between that, right? And and this is, I think, the, the the kind of more realistic case for higher inflation. And that's you have inflation that's running at 3.5% because you continue to have wage growth similar to what it is right now. And, and that's the embedded inflation, I think, that the Fed's worried about. And if that becomes so uh, more factual, which we won't know, quite frankly, till the second half of next year, um, you, know, you know, that's that's an environment where the Federal Reserve will probably have to hike much faster than, uh, than the market's currently pricing. And and yeah. I, I don't – that's not my base case, but that is a realistic possibility that I think the market's kind of fighting against in, in both yeah. directions. Ira, thank you so much. Ira Jersey with us with some final thoughts this morning as we move from Gina Martin-Adams and her equity abilities to Mr. Jersey and fixed income. Lisa, I love that idea that there's a polarity of opinions – and Mr. Jersey goes to the in-betweenness of it all. That's where the Fed's going to try to stay as they try to uh, both dovetail the political em emphasis on inflation while allowing <clears throat> the employment market to run hot. I think that if we just take a look, if we broaden out here, the takeaway was this was a big headline miss, but it was a big win when you look at the underlying components. You are seeing yields rise, and I think to Kriti Gupta's very, very astute point earlier, good news uh, for the economy is good news for markets. Even as yields rise, you are seeing the 
NASDAQ uh, actually climbed further, up almost a half a percent. To me, that really speaks volumes, that basically what the market is implying right now, if you're going to give it a narrative, is that the Fed is going to hike rates next yeah. year and that the economy <clears throat> and markets are strong enough to withstand it. And Lisa, the, me the drawdown of all the angst of this week, I can't believe it's been a five-day work week. Extraordinary. Not Lisa, the maximum drawdown here, a negative 3.46% on Standard & Poor's 500. You know, yes, it's been volatile, but it hasn't really been hasn't that moved. significant in with yeah. respect to the actual moves. How much does this give the Fed confidence, right, that they can go ahead versus has the market not really fully priced in in all of its different facets no. the idea of a faster rate hike? We're going to continue the debate forward, including John Farrow's conversation with the Secretary of Labor across his nation. I'm going to call it an ambiguous labor report uh, as well, certainly a constructive spin from the White House this morning. Futures up 18, Dow futures up 113. Please do stay with us on radio, on television. This is Bloomberg. What a fascinating payrolls report from New York City for our audience worldwide. Good morning, good morning. Your equity market picture looks like this, up four-tenths of one percent on the S&P. The countdown to the open starts right now. Everything you need to get set for the start of U.S. trading. This is Bloomberg, the open with Jonathan Farrow. from New York, we begin with the big issue. Next stop, December 15th. Look at what we've heard from Jay Powell. Jay Powell saying it's time for them to exit the market. This tells you that the Fed want optionality. It does raise the stakes for the December meeting. Chair Powell has shown that he's doing what every good central banker does. This is Powell building in some flexibility. Buying himself a, a ton of flexibility to respond to the data. It's not the Jay Powell show, it's the committee show. We've heard a number of Fed officials essentially reflect this pivot. We spend too much time on the rhetoric. This all comes back down to inflation. The potential for this accelerated taper. Look at how markets are now priced for next year. The market has pulled these rate hikes early there's clearly more pressure on the Fed to act now. The next step will be at the December FOMC meeting. And the countdown to that begins right now. We can do that with BlackRock's Rick Reader, Mohammed al Aaron of Bloomberg Opinion, and Queen's College, Cambridge. Let's come to both of you first on the labour market report. Mohammed, first to you, sir. Your reaction? My reaction, John, is overall a strong report. Not in every component. Job creation was particularly disappointing at 211,000, but the unemployment rate going down to 4.2 percent, relatively contained wage growth, sharp declines in minority unemployment, and let's not forget the increase in labor force participation. So overall good. Economists will disagree as to how good. The marketplace is giving a very clear signal. It says to the Fed, go ahead. Take your foot off the accelerator, the stimulus accelerator. The economy can take it. Nothing here to stop them. You strip out the 210. Rick Reader, you take away 210, and the rest of this report looks pretty solid, doesn't it? Boy, I think it's, I think it's a good report across the board, Jonathan. I mean, the, uh, the dynamics around, if you take the non-seasonally adjusted data, it's over 700,000 jobs over the last six months. To, I mean, this month alone, look at the household report. The household report was incredibly strong, over a million jobs. Pretty, pretty impressive numbers across the board. I mean, yes, they're going to debate the, the top line payroll report. But if you marry this to claims data, the jolts data, the job openings data, there's no ambiguity. I mean, the Fed has a window to move, and, uh, and obviously they're going to take advantage of it. That lift in the front end continues, then it resumes. Yields up two basis points on twos to about 64 basis points. Mike McKee dropping by to get us up to speed on his view. Mike, you've had about 30 minutes on this one. Your view now. I think you start with the seasonal adjustment factor, a very tough one for this November, 568,000 jobs. So there were 778,000 non-seasonally adjusted jobs restored, and they took away almost 600,000 of them to get that 210 number. So uh, if you had... Uh, 
put it in terms of 2020, a year ago, there were only 289,000 jobs subtracted. We would have had a much number, a number much closer to 500,000. Here's the other numbers that, uh, as you can see, the unemployment rate drops to 4.2 percent. Over 500,000 people come back into the labor force, which pushes up the participation rate by two tenths to 61.8 percent. The Fed's going to be very happy with that. And then, of course, their criteria for raising rates or for at least uh, getting out of the QE business has been the unemployment rate for minorities. Black unemployment falls 1.2 percent to uh, percentage points to 6.7 percent. Hispanic down to 5.2. Women's down to 4 percent. And the female participation rate rises as well. So overall good news, exactly the kind of things that the Fed is looking for. A bit of a surprise in the leisure and hospitality sector. Uh, only uh, 32,000 jobs created in that whole area. And I wonder if what we're seeing is jobs have gone away because a lot of restaurants, bars did not reopen and hotels are still not getting uh, business. The number uh, that Rick referenced, 1.14 million people getting jobs during the month, that's uh, in the household survey, that's a significant reason that the unemployment rate fell by four-tenths during the month. A uh, huge number of jobs created on that survey and that's why you see this big dichotomy between the headline numbers on the uh, payrolls establishment report and the headline number for unemployment. Um, and I guess uh, the only other thing to say about it is where's the Fed going to go from here? It hasn't yep. pushed the markets uh, significantly higher, but we do see almost uh, two rate increases now implied by, uh, it's about one and a half, uh, by July of next year. So the markets are beginning to think the Fed is going to get back into action. That's the next stop. Mike, thank you. We go straight to December 15th when the Federal Reserve meets. 24 hours after that, we'll hear from the ECB and the Bank of England. Mohammed, you wrote this on the Federal Reserve and the pivot that seemingly we got from Chairman Powell this week. Such a late wake-up to the reality of inflation increases the risk of mismanaging its policy catch-up process, exposing the economy to a higher risk of an unnecessary Fed-induced slowdown. Mohammed, can you build on that and reflect on what you heard from the Chairman this week? So, John, the problem, and I think the market pricing is consistent with this, is that when you start late, at some point, developments on the ground force you to go faster than you would normally want to go. And if you go faster than you normally want to go, you risk breaking something. And that is what I, how I interpret a lot of what's been happening on the curve, where people have been pricing in the Fed going faster than they had before, but also worrying about what will happen longer term to the economy. And that's the problem of a highly leveraged economy, is that if you are late, you risk making a policy mistake. Um, there is a window to avoid it, but the Fed is going to have to be very smart, both in what it says in its communication and its in policy implementation. There's one very interesting disconnect in all of this, though, Rick, and I want to build on, on it with both of you. We've all seen the Fed calls come from Wall Street this week. Barclays at May, the rest of them at June, way out in Q1 23, you've got the likes of TD and Morgan Stanley. But the bulk believes that liftoff takes place at some point in spring to summer next year. But, Rick, here's the disconnect for me. Earlier and faster, OK, that's the view right now. Higher, I don't see that. Earlier, faster, why not higher, Rick? Why is there this belief that if we start next year, ultimately, rates go to 175 and that's your lot? So, Jonathan, I think it goes back to, you know, what is potential growth of the economy? Listen to me. So if you go back, I mean, the numbers are pretty staggering. You think about the, nom if you take nominal GDP this year, John, if you take what we're going to get, we could get 11% nominal GDP, real, actually almost exactly split, real and inflation. You're going to decelerate next year. But by the way, it's still going to be strong. I mean, I think the numbers you can get a seven-ish nominal GDP. So let's say that's four real, three inflation, if you assume inflation comes down a bit. So now, but then where are you going after that? And to your point, you know, I think, listen, I think potential growth of the economy runs it in and around 2%. We've had massive monetary, massive fiscal stimulus, and we're coming off the backside of that. The tricky part about the Fed being late and, uh, you know, we talked about this for a long time. They should have moved earlier. The tricky part about being late is you have an economy that's coming off the boil. 
you're going to have to, there's going to be this, how fast are you on the gas pedal, or, or I guess probably the brake, about how much you want to move in an economy that's probably naturally going to decelerate into a, you know, towards the latter part of next year into the year after. That's where I think the tricky thing is. Listen, I think rates, I don't think rates are going that high because A, because of the potential growth, B, you know, here people talk about what is the market telling you? What the market's telling you is the liquidity is so big and the natural demand for yield is immense. And I, you watch that play through the markets every day. Yeah, I think this is the important conversation. It's not lift off. It's about high, how high they take interest rates, how much work they need to do. It's been fascinating for me, gents, to hear from the Federal Reserve officials that are leaving the Federal Reserve who are starting to say maybe what they really think. Take a listen to what Governor Quiles had to say on what the Fed's got to do. And I think that's entirely consistent with saying we're going to wait to see the whites of their eyes. We never said we'd let the army march over us. Uh, and so, you know, the army is upon us. And so now we'll begin to fire. Mohammed, this is the conversation we're having. The army is upon us. Now we begin to fire. How much do they need to fire? Well, he's basically saying we're late. You know, the, the army is, is above us and we don't want it to go over us. He's basically saying we are late. And I think what we're getting, John, is a lot of indications that within the Fed, there was a more hawkish tone than what the press conference suggested. And Priya Misra, on your earlier show, made that point, is that if you look at the press conference and you look at the minutes of the FOMC meeting, or if you listen to what the majority of people have said since, it is a more hawkish Fed than what the chair signaled um, at the press conference. And I think the chair is, is, is feeling a lot of pressure um, because people are worried. They're worried about the anchoring inflation expectations, and they should be. I think Rick and I have been saying for months, they are late, they are late. Be careful because you end up with a high risk of a policy error that let's, let's just be clear, it's not about markets as much as it is about the economy. It's about an unnecessary damage to the economy and to livelihood. And Mohammed, you've been making this argument now for months. There is a degree of difference, though, that I hear sense between you and Rick this morning. Rick believes that, yes, liftoff, sure, they're behind the curve, they need to do something, but ultimately they can't do that much with interest rates. They can only take them so high. Mohammed, you and I are familiar with that argument from the former New York Fed president, Bill Dudley, from earlier this year. We had that panel together, and he made the argument that if they wait too long, they'll have to go, and they'll have to go higher than people in this market expect. Are you one of those? Do you agree with Bill Dudley on that? No, I mean, I disagreed with Bill, Bill Dudley at the time. I still disagree with him because the economy cannot support the 4 to 5 percent that he, at that point, saw as a destination. I don't think we can get there, John. We have a highly levered economy. We have a marketplace that has been wired for not just an incredible amount of liquidity, but for low interest rates for a long time. Put all that together, this is not a, an economy and a marketplace that can sustain four and five. So on the way to four and five, things start breaking. So that, that's the problem. That's why it was so critical to start early so that you don't have that high risk. So, Rick, how do you invest around all of this now? We've got a payrolls report. We've got a sense for what the <laughs> yeah. Fed's going to do on the 15th, an idea for where it might go in 22. What have you been doing, Rick? So, by the way, I'll go back. I think Mohammed described it uh, exactly right. You know, this is you, you, the point about things can break, and when you're late, you've got to think through that from an investment paradigm. What does that mean? The first thing that has to happen the Fed needs to exit this QE business. And you know, the question of how far they're going to go or how much they're going to go, they need to get out of the QE business. So the, the thought they're pumping more liquidity. There was a, it was a Tuesday. There were two, there were two injections of more liquidity into the market. That is crazy. So they need to get out. So, But what you have to do when you invest, you have to think about, gosh, we're now going to be in a lower liquidity period. We're now going to be what, you know, what is going to be a more uncertain period. Quite frankly, there's an awful lot of patience that you need to bring to the equation. We've been doing that in portfolios. And so, you know, you pull back on the high yield market, you pull back on how much equity exposure do you have, and you got to be a bit cautious. You know, you run higher levels of cash today. And then you look at areas, exactly like Mom had said, there are areas that are now starting to come unglued. If you look at what happened this week around some of the tech stocks, some of the, some of the software companies, and by the way, some of, some businesses that are really good businesses that all of a sudden people are you have crowded trades in, people have to get out. That's the time you invest. So we're doing much more opportunistic investing, and I think you got to be a bit more careful than when you had immense liquidity in the system, a huge tailwind of growth, 
And now you just got a little bit of patience, a little bit more cash, and then be more opportunistic. Rick, let's continue the conversation. Rick Mohammed, sticking with us, coming up on the program, the talk of the town down in D.C., Omicron. That's next. The key thing is going to be how uh, the variant and, and in particular policy responses to the variant come out. From New York City, this is Bloomberg. market that over the past few weeks has made it clear it wants to go higher. It got a little spooked by the idea that geopolitical potentials are rising. Mercedes-Benz is on a path towards CO2 neutral uh, mobility. So we have flicked the switch there and really uh, we're going to step by step electrify everything. And what does that mean? Combustion engines get electrified. President unveiling his winter COVID strategy and expanding access to booster shots. This coming as lawmakers pass the stopgap spending bill. Late last night with Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer saying the following. With this agreement, there will be no government shutdown. For more, let's head down to Washington and catch up with Joe Matthew. Morning, Joe. Morning, Jonathan. It says a lot about where we are here when we're celebrating the agreement, the passage of a continuing resolution that simply funds the government through the middle of February, but that's where we are here. And to your point, President Biden speaking about the new variant, the Omicron variant, and I do want to just add a little bit of measure here. I hate to be the one to lay on more uncertainty, but the jobs numbers you are talking about, of course, are very much dependent going forward on what happens with this variant. The president did speak about it yesterday, rolled out the speech that we discussed, Jonathan, around this time, and he made good on, on all of our expectations, even adding a couple of details, an increased booster program, more at-home testing that he says insurers should be covering by January. That was a little more detail there and a big effort to vaccinate the world. But I will add, that speech had no specifics about the new variant. In fact, it frankly could have been delivered before we ever heard of it. A lot of questions about where the next jobs report is going to be, Jonathan. It was only a couple of days ago that this market was staring over a cliff on concerns that Omicron would keep more people from returning to work and could prompt more inflation. So this is something we'll be listening for today. I suspect Labor Secretary Marty Walsh may weigh in on that. We do expect, by the way, to hear from President Biden on today's jobs report a bit later on this morning. Jonathan. Secretary Walsh, 13 minutes away. Joe, thank you. Good to catch up, sir. Looking forward to your coverage a little bit later. Back with us, Rick Reader, Mohammed al Arian. The upside risk, the downside risk around this variant. Rick, the outcomes are still incredibly wide. Morgan Stanley's Ellen Zetner said this to me this morning. The risk around Omicron is that they have to hike earlier, not later. 
Rick, we don't have the data to draw conclusions right now. As you look at the range of outcomes, how wide are they from your perspective? So, you know, I'll tell you the tricky thing, Jonathan, with this with this variant, and that is, uh, I think, quite frankly, a bit more concerning than some of the others, is the transmissibility of it is significant. And we don't know the answers yet. We won't know. My sense is the severity is not that significant. But the uh, but we don't know the answers for the next weeks. Right, you're seeing this unbelievable illiquidity in markets. I mean, I haven't seen uh, the markets this less this <laughs> this low convicted in a very long time. What do you do with? By the way, the thing I thought I think their point was right. If you have, if you think about this, if you have this increase in uh, in, in in transmissibility and you have to have some shutdowns, you, you introduce a longer extension of the of the of the lockdown and supply chain dynamics that do create a bit more inflation. It's interesting the market. This week, we're battling back and forth between lower growth means lower inflation. I actually think at parts it was actually misguided because if you do, which I think Alan said, if you do create this dynamic, what's really impacting inflation today is supply. And if you, if you shut down supply again, you create what is an accelerating problem around inflation again. You talked about the disconnect in this market as well. And Mohammed, I'd love your view on that. This has felt like a really ugly week. We're two or three percentage points away from all-time highs on the S&P 500, Mama. Mohammed, I just wonder, from your standpoint, what you make of that. It feels really bad. Yet when you look at the price action, is it? Well, I think that Wick was absolutely right. It's an issue of liquidity. So you get a lot of volatility, but then you look back for the week as a whole, and you wonder why it felt so strange. John, there's another element is that we are still getting a lot of information out of South Africa. And I must tell you, I am getting more worried. Um, I've talked to quite a few scientists, and there is complete agreement, as Rick said, that this is a much more infectious variant, much more than Delta. And we know how bad Delta is. There is still not enough data to suggest, is it, is it vaccine evasive or not? Some scientists are really worried about this, and they're going to go into details. Others are saying, let's wait for more information. And therefore, it's not clear to us where, where those hospital, hospitalizations are going to go. So we're going to learn a lot from South Africa over the next few days and weeks. In the meantime, we're seeing another effect that markets have to deal with, and they haven't yet quite understood what's going on, enormous dispersion in government reaction. You're getting mixed signals domestically, which means expectations are all over the place, and you're getting different approaches internationally, which means that you can't have a common response. Bottom line, I don't think it's a big issue for demand overall. It's an issue for the composition of demand, but it is an issue for supply. And as Rick rightly said, it will make supply chain issues persist for longer, and it will make labor shortages persist for longer. Now, I want to pick up on that point about geographic dispersion here, just in terms of the reaction function of policymakers in, say, Europe, China, and the United States. Rick, does that shape how you allocate money from a regional perspective? Europe versus China versus, say, the United States? Wow, that's a great question. I mean, so you have to think about the, the short term and the long term. I mean, from a short term perspective, you have to think about what the shutdown potential is. I would, you know, from my perspective, it's more intense around sectors. So you think about today, gosh, if we're going to create a shutdown, gosh, do I want to own a lot in the travel sector? I got to be a bit more careful on energy commodity. You know, regionally, listen, I think the U.S. is going to grow. I think the demand function in the U.S. is ingrained in the system today and will continue to promote uh, itself through next year. I think Europe's a bit, a bit trickier. I think China, listen, that's the slowdown in China is a place you want to be a bit careful about the regulatory evolution. So, you know, we're staying much more cautious there for the for the time being. So when you boil it all, by the way, emerging markets is clearly uncertain around the, the growth response around inflation dynamics. So, you know, we've had a heavier intensity around our U.S. exposure, and we're going to keep it that way. But then also, by the way, there are parts of Europe we talked about on your show, European banks, yeah. which, got, by the way, I think are pretty interesting again because they came under pressure in the last week or so. But I would say sector more prolific, but, but definitely with a heavier orientation towards the U.S. Mohammed, final word for you, sir. Conviction trade right now. What would it be? I think what Rick said was absolutely right. Favor the U.S. over the rest of the world and be very difficult, be very, very, very careful about sector allocation and within sector allocation about airlines. Look, in airlines, I'm okay with an airline that flies domestically. I'm less okay with an airline that flies internationally. And the final thing, political risk. We don't talk much about it, 
but political risk is becoming a bigger and bigger factor for international investors. Gents, always feel lucky to catch up with you guys after payrolls. Appreciate it this morning. As always, Rick Reader, Mohammed al Aaron, your payrolls report, 210,000. The downside, a miss from an estimate of 550. Elsewhere, though, this Labour report, pretty decent, and we need to discuss it with the White House. Reaction first from the Labour Secretary, Marty Walsh. That's just around the corner. Your morning calls are as well. From New York City, this is Bloomberg. minutes away from the opening bell in New York City this morning. Good morning. A lift in this equity market. Equity futures up four tenths of one percent. The Nasdaq up about a third of one percent. That's the price action in a stock market. Here are your morning calls. First up, we begin with Citi upgrading Morgan Stanley to a buy. The analyst highlighting the lender's best in class business model and management team up there 1.4 percent in early trading. Cowan downgrading Smith & Wesson to market perform. The analyst expecting a tough year after earnings fell short and a number of metrics were down there big time. Negative 17% going into the opening bout. And finally, Deutsche Bank initiating coverage on Peloton with a buy rating. The analyst seeing plenty of upside with investors overlooking strengthening fundamentals and earnings power. Positive there, 4.63% to 46.51. Coming up on the program, the White House Response. U.S. Labor Secretary Marty Walsh joining us with his reaction to the payrolls report. The opening bell just around the corner. Futures with a lift on the S&P advancing 17. We're up four tenths of one percent from a beautiful New York City this morning. Good morning. This is Bloomberg.
world's urban areas are most vulnerable to climate change. Cities consume 78% of the world's energy, while also generating 60% of greenhouse gas emissions. By the year 2100, 85% of the world's population is expected to live in cities. 90% of all urban areas are coastal. And with sea levels rising, 800 million residents are likely to be affected. 1.9 degrees to 4.4 degrees Celsius is the projected increase in urban temperatures around the world by year 2100. By 2050, 1.6 billion people are projected to be vulnerable to chronic extreme heat. Bloomberg has enhanced search on the terminal to deliver what you need when you need it. Now, you can simply type phrases in everyday English in the command line. Compare financials. Find people. Analyze markets. You can enter phrases or ask questions. What do you want to know today? Ask a question or visit SearchGo to find answers now. Right now, about half of U.S. households invest. We'd like to get that number up to 95 plus percent. Investing should be as ubiquitous as shopping online. It should just be something that people do. I think that it's hard to put your head around any narrative. Let's just be honest. We've had sort of a shift in, are we in some sort of stagflation fears moment? People were talking about that all day yesterday. Live from New York City this morning, good morning. Would you have thought that we might actually end this week in positive territory? That's where we're heading right now. Equity futures up four tenths of one percent on the S&P, advancing about 20 points. On the Nasdaq, up 57, advancing about a third of one percent. From New York, that's your opening bell. Switch on the board and get to the bond market. What a trip it's been for Treasuries this week. Two-year yields higher, 10-year yields lower, the curve flatter. It's been a story over the last few days. The curve flattered to about 80 odd basis points, basically, essentially, where we started the year, a full round trip. This morning, yields up at the long end by about a basis point on tens to 145.80. On twos, up three basis points to 64, just short of where we were last week at 65. What we've heard from the Fed speak today, Jim Bullard, first out the gate, repeating he favors speeding up the pace of taper, acknowledging that it's too soon to judge the impact of the Omicron variant on the economy. Let's dig into the price section about 30 seconds into the session and get your open. Here's Abby. John, it is pretty extraordinary that we are looking at a weekly gain right now, given the volatility you were just talking about. We do have some volatility today, too, relative to two big laggers, starting out with the shares of Didi. They are down sharply, reversing a gain earlier. This, of course, on the news that they are going to be delisting from U.S. exchanges and are planning a Hong Kong share listing in March. DocuSign, the worst day ever in its young life, plunging 34 percent. This on a debacle quarter, third quarter Billings missed, the revenue forecast was down, and there were cuts on the street, including uh, Dan Ives over at Wedbush, who's generally pretty bullish. As for the macro movers that are helping the market in this bullish tone, another day of reflationary or cyclical value. Take a look at ExxonMobil up 1.2% in sympathy with that oil climbing, as you uh, showed, and then Morgan Stanley up 1%. Banks doing well with the small lift in yields, plus Morgan Stanley raised to a buy over at Citigroup, John. Abby, thank you. Thank you very much. About 1 minute 30 in, your equity market's doing Doing okay in the bond market. Yields higher at the front end by about three basis points. That wasn't the initial reaction in this bond market. There was a bid through the belly of the curve off the back of that downside surprise. But when you start to process the rest of the report, the rest of the report actually pretty decent when you pour through it. Outside of the 210, unemployment coming down, down, down to 4.2%. The estimate there was 4.5. Unemployment much lower. Wages doing okay. Inflation, though, still the big story. From New York, I'm pleased to say, joining us now on TV and on Bloomberg Radio on the payrolls report, first reaction from the White House with U.S. Labor Secretary Marty Walsh. Secretary Walsh, great to catch up with you, sir, as always. Help me with this one, because we've all struggled with this labor market report this morning. How would you characterize the state of the labor market right now, Secretary Walsh, in the United States? I would say if you look at what's happened since President Biden's taken office, he's dropped two points off the unemployment numbers. 
Uh, I'd say we have a strong, strong, strong market moving forward. Obviously, we have job openings that we have to work on, uh, and we still have people out of work. And we, as you mentioned in, in, in the in the, uh, the the words before I came on here, uh, we're still dealing with the coronavirus. We're looking at the new variant now to see what the impacts that'll have. But overall, I, I, we feel good. I feel good about where we're going as an economy here. Uh, obviously, you brought inflation up as well. You know, the president made some moves this week with with uh, the oil reserves and, and also, you know, creating an economic plan. Uh, we're seeing people with with more opportunities and, and more more money in in their bank accounts than this time last year uh, or, or pre-pandemic, I guess I should say. Uh, so, you know, we still have work to do. There's no question about it. But but I feel good where we're headed. Let's talk about that work and the work we still need to do. As you know, we talked a lot about where wages are, close to five percent. Below where inflation is currently and going into next week, I believe a lot of people in this economy, in this market, on Wall Street, Secretary Walsh, looking for something closer to 7 on CPI. Do you still the, see the benefits of running this economy hot, Secretary Walsh? Are there benefits to doing that as you see things? Well, well, well you know, well, one of the things I just want to talk this week I went out to Los Angeles. I was out at the ports in Los Angeles and Long Beach. And when you think about the economy, you think about people coming back to work. One of the things when I was out there, you know, we have the longshoremen working 24 7, not every day, but, but the ability to work 24 7. We're seeing the ships come in, we're seeing the ships unloaded. And there's an issue with truck driving. And when you think about when you think about this economy, and we think about all the different aspects, we really we have to be more intentional now and focus on certain areas. And how do we create better opportunities? So truck driving is one of those areas that we have to create better pathways to bring more people back to work. When you look at this report, you see manufacturing; uh, the numbers are high. You look at transportation; the numbers are high. You look at hospital care and health care; the numbers aren't as high. So we have to we have to start to focus now intentionally in different re different sectors of the, of the economy to make sure we get we get people trained up and get people back to work. So this is not about a broad-based effort to run an economy hot. You think this is about specifically targeting certain sectors? Is that right? Right. Well, I think we have to target certain sectors now to bring those sectors back. I mean, we look at some, some of these numbers. Hospitality this month, uh, the numbers are kind of, I don't want to say flat, but, but we didn't see growth in hospitality. Uh, we didn't see growth in construction. We saw growth in the construction in the sector. We didn't see any growth, actually job loss, in the government sector. So we really have to start looking at these different sectors and see what the supports they need. And that's quite honestly what, in the Build Back Better reconciliation plan the president has put out there, there's 20, uh, there's a couple, I think almost $20 billion in, in job training workforce development money that, that will allow us the opportunity here at the Department of Labor to kind of focus on, on other sectors to, to help create and, and build them up. The reason I ask this question is because there was a big effort to get us back to where we were before the pandemic. And one measure of that one metric was the employment to population ratio, which is back to about 59. Before the pandemic, it was at about 61. And Secretary Walsh, the Federal Reserve, the administration has talked about getting back to where we were. Do you think that's achievable? How dependent do you think this really is on just the virus? Is there something else going on here in this labor market? Well, yeah, I, I think we have to. I think we, we have to be realistic about the labor market and, and look at what what is the future going to look like. I think that uh, the pandemic has changed the way, or at least had conversations about the way uh, the, the office looks. People work in teleworking. Uh, we've seen 30 percent. I think last month, if I get the number correctly, 30 percent increase in entrepreneurship in this country. So it, it, you know, th th there is an evolution and a change going on to some degree. I think that measuring measuring the way we do our economy back to February of 2020. I don't know if it will look like that when we get beyond the virus, but I definitely think that with the president and the administration staying focused on creating opportunities. 5.8, almost 6 million jobs created since President Biden has taken office. 4.2 percent unemployment rate today, which is a good number. We obviously wanted to continue that number going down. Uh, we've seen better participation in the black unemployment rate drop a whole percent. Women put the unemployment rate four percent. We're starting to see some gains here. Now we do. We still. We, I think we have to continue to acknowledge there's work to be done. Do you personally have more work to do in the seat you're in right now, Secretary Walsh? No question about it. I mean, we have a lot of work to do. We, we have to work on uh, making sure that we implement the unemployment uh, insurance. Um, work that we're doing in kind of uh, re reorganizing unemployment insurance, $2, million, $2 billion. We have an office created, uh, job force, workforce development, training money. I really want to look at changing the way we train uh, workers. I think we want to make sure we're training workers, not just for the jobs of today, but the jobs of the future, and thinking about more creating more pre-apprentice programs. We have a lot of work to do here at the Department of Labor. The reason I asked, sir, it's not a personal attack. There was just some news this week that maybe you might be interested in the seat that Charlie Baker might leave empty in the coming year. Uh do you want to respond you put that to that? Right over, Do you, you want put, to respond to that, that, sir? You put that right over my head. I wasn't even paying attention. Uh, as I said, I have a lot of work to do here at the Department of Labor. Politico <laughs> says you're weighing the run 
Is that true or false? Well, listen, the, the governor and myself have a great relationship. We, we, you know, we were partners for seven, six years in Boston. He, I was uh, one year with Governor Patrick. Uh, we did a lot of work. We, we, what, we started the pandemic together. Uh, we got the city of Boston, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, at least through the beginning days of the pandemic. Uh, and, and for the last week, I've been, I've been out in L.A., Long Beach, uh, all over the country, here in Washington today. So I'll leave it at that. Should I take a signal from your refusal to answer that direct question? <laughs> There's no signal. I love my job here. Secretary Walsh, we'll let you go, sir. I know you've got a busy morning. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks for being with us. The Thank U.S. You. Labor Market Secretary, Marty Walsh, there. Joining us now, iCapital's Anastasia Ramoroso, P. Jim's Mike Collins. Guys, great to have you with us. Let's work through this equity market, this bond market, too. Anastasia, your response to the labor market report out about an hour ago. I think it is much, much better than the headline would suggest, John. And I think it's exactly the kind of report that the Fed actually wants to see. Because what they want is they want people coming back into the labor force and finding jobs. And that's exactly what we got. If we look at the household survey, you actually saw close to a million jobs that was created in that survey. So I think it captures a little bit more than the establishment. you got some self-employed workers there. You've got the household workers. So I think, John, what it suggests is that people are maybe a little bit more at ease with the virus now because of the vaccines and testing and all the tools that we have available and they are coming back and they're finding jobs. So that's a positive and it's a positive for the Fed. Mike Collins, your take. Yeah, Jonathan, I think this is a really good story about supply, right? This number to me is all about supply coming back online, as Anastasia said, you know, million household jobs added. The average wage gains of those jobs was a little bit lower, right? Because these are lower paying service jobs, the jobs where we have all the shortages. So those are coming back. So this is actually a good story for a moderation in inflation. But, but we do have an issue with the general narrative that this is all supply induced, right? We've done a lot of work this week that the bigger reason for this higher inflation is the surge in demand we've seen since COVID hit. I mean, supply production of stuff has gone up. Shipping of stuff has gone up. Rig counts have gone up. But demand, especially for durable goods and imports, are so much higher than they were before the pandemic that the supply just can't keep up. So you're going to see demand naturally moderate as the fiscal stimulus wanes, and you are seeing supply come back. So this is actually a really good story. This is why long-term rates are just stuck in this really narrow range. So is the Fed making a move going into strength or weakness? Mike Collins, I asked that question because Bank of America put out that report this morning. They said the zeitgeist is Fed tightening into a slowdown. It will eventually, but the economy ain't slowing yet. The Fed hasn't even started tightening. Strong data for the next three to four months will mean inflation, a much more aggressive Fed, and a higher terminal rate and real yields. Mike Collins, what's your response to the work of Bank of America? Yeah, you know, they, they, they have to start moving. I totally agree. You know, do the taper, get it over with, uh, start hiking. But it's really that terminal rate that, that we push back on, Jonathan. If people think that the Fed can hit their 2.5% target on the funds rate or even get higher than that, as some people uh, think, I think they're really missing the big picture here. And the big picture is in a year and two and three years from now, just as the Fed is, is raising rates, uh, demand is going to be slowing more quickly than people think, and supply will be coming online probably more quickly than people think, and inflation is going to be coming down. So, so the Fed has to be really careful. Yeah, they should lift off. They should get the funds rate to 1%, maybe 1.5%, but I think that's it for the cycle, and that is what's priced in. So the markets are, are kind of on sides with that view right now. You're in line with Rick Reader, with Mohamed al as well. They believe the same thing. Anastasia, a final word on you and that, on that. It's a really important conversation. It's not about liftoff. It's about how far they can take it once they start get, getting going. How far can they take it? Well, I think they have a ways to go. I mean, one thing to put in perspective right now, because inflation is running so hot and the rates are at zero or the 10 years at one and a half percent, we have deeply negative real rates right now. So I do think they have to make up that lost ground. And maybe that means faster hiking rates, unless inflation, if Mike is right, really starts to come down next year. So um, they have to move. That's one thing. We're going to continue this conversation. Lucky to have Anastasia Ramoroso and Mike Collins with us. We'll continue the conversation and throw in a little bit on crude. Coming up. Investors applauding OPEC's supply boost escape clause. The net of this is means less spare capacity in OPEC and likely less shale or less Iranian oil. So it reinforces that medium to longer term supply driven bullish story. That conversation still ahead from New York. This is Bloomberg.
access the financial world on demand. Hear from leading economists, policymakers, and industry experts via live and on-demand webinars only from Bloomberg. Start exploring to see what's moving the markets. Visit Bloomberg.com webinars. Antibody responses produced by these by this vaccination is able to potently neutralize the virus and a number of variants of concern. A lot of the vaccines being developed currently require super cold storage. One of the great advantages of our patch is that we're able to remove the cold chain. We've been able to stabilize the vaccine on the patch for at least a month at room temperature and a week at 40 degrees. So this makes logistically vaccine rollout a much simpler proposition, removing the cold chain from transport. went ahead with the increase. Uh, we do think there were some political considerations at play over here as well, but the genius move was keeping this meeting open. It's probably going to be the longest meeting ever. Uh, immediately puts a put, right? And therefore, you, you know, you, you're not going to be brave enough to sell against that. Crude rallying this morning after OPEC's addition of an escape clause to plan supply hikes, leaving the door open for a change of heart. The White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki applauding the boost in output. We appreciate the close coordination over the recent weeks with our partners, Saudi Arabia, UAE, the UAE, and other OPEC Plus producers to help address price pressures. Together with our recent coordinated uh, release from the SPR, we believe this should help facilitate the global economic recovery. Crew this morning, 68.92, up 3.6%. Still with us, Anastasia Ramoroso and Mike Collins. Anastasia, this oil picture, how much of it is it a factor in your outlook for the next 12 months for your broad-based allocation decisions? Well, it, it's a very important factor. Obviously, if we look at inflation and gasoline prices and oil, that's been a big driver of inflation in the last 12 months. So to the extent that we settle in this 60 to $80 price range for oil, I think that would be constructive for inflation slowly but gradually coming down. So that's one thing. But the other thing is that this is an asset class and this is an asset that people like to trade. And one of the better trades for 2021 has actually been the energy trade. Until recently, it was up about 51%. And then we've seen this complete washout in the oil market over the last week. And if I look to the equity markets, if I look at what happened price action last week, oil is one place that is screaming oversold from technical levels and now increasingly from fundamental levels. So I think the reason why it's rebounding this morning is because even if OPEC is going to continue to boost production, we're starting from very low levels of inventories, and those inventories need to re be rebuilt. And once again, the very fact that they've maintained the optionality is very positive. But probably the most bullish thing from OPEC this week was the fact that they said they're not worried about Omicron right now. They're not worried about the immediate consequences on travel. So I think that contributed to the rebound in oil, energy, equities, and the markets broadly. Mike Collins, your response, please. 
yeah, well, obviously, John, predicting the price of oil is a is a fool's errand. But I will tell you, I will tell you two <laughs> things. Like right? nobody thought it would be negative forty a year and a half ago. I will tell you two things. Uh, um, oil is very correlated, as Anastasia indicated, to, to near-term inflation and to near-term inflation expectations. And we have been explicitly betting in our portfolios that it, in those inflation expectations have peaked and would come down. And sure enough, if you look at the five-year break-even, it was three and a quarter not that long ago. It's about two and three quarters now. Uh, secondly, in our portfolios where we own credit, we are still long uh, energy companies in general, some gas producers, some pipelines, because even at the current level of oil price, these companies are making a lot of money, right? So you don't have to get the price of oil right as a credit investor. You have to get the earnings and cash flow right. And I think we're in a really good position. There. Mike, to be clear here, you think there's too much crowding into the inflation protection, those kind of trades that have built up over the last 12 months. Are you actively fading that? And if so, how? Yeah, we've, we've reached the peak and passed the peak in inflation hysteria, uh, John. As I said, the, the supply-demand imbalance is already coming closer together, and at some point it, we will equilibrate, and it will probably move in the opposite direction. I'm worried that in two years from now, Jonathan, we're sitting here, demand is down, and now we have all this supply of chips and, and oil and cars and washing machines coming online, and there's excess inventory, right? That is actually a real risk over the longer term. The markets always overshoot and, and overreact. So, so yeah, we're definitely betting that those break-even rates keep coming down. Uh, and you can do that through, through you know, inflation swaps and inflation break-even types of trades in the bond market. That sounds like the Kathy Wood argument going out into the distance from here. I just wonder what you would do with that, Anastasia. If that's the story for several years' time, what do you do in the next six to 12 months? Yeah, so I have a couple of takes on inflation. I do agree with Mike that I think we're past the peak inflation in terms of markets pricing that in, and we're going to start to see that come down in inflation expectations. So it's probably late to chase some of those trades. But at the same time, if you look at inflation, it's still expected to be something like 4.6% next year. So 4.6% just raises your hurdle rate for what your portfolio has to do. And we just talked about the Fed potentially raising rates even next year on top of tapering. So that likely means that the multiples for the S&P are going to compress. That means that it's going to be harder to offset. Uh, you know, you're going to have some pressure on the 10% earnings rate for the rate for the S&P. So bottom line, equity returns will be more subdued. Bond returns, at least in, in duration, is likely to be negative next year. And you have this high inflation hurdle rate. So what do you need to do in the portfolio? And I think the answer to that is get things like real estate in the portfolio that actually does have inflation pathers. And by the way, shelter inflation, as Fed Chair Powell said, is heating up. And that's one thing. And the second thing is you need to get hyper growth in the portfolio. And we're finding that today in crypto and we're finding that today in venture capital. Can't bring up crypto at the end of the show, Anastasia. We need the extra time to actually <laughs> we'll talk take it about up it. Next time. We're going to do it next time. Anastasia Amoroso, thank you. To Mike Collins, thank you, sir. To both of you for joining us on this Payrolls Friday. There was a really interesting line from Savita Subramaniam of Bank of America a little bit earlier today. And this was in the research. And I'll bring you the quote just quickly Taper, Titan, Tina. Question mark. She says, what happens to the Tina? There is no alternative to stocks trade argument. If cash yields rival the S&P 500's 1.3% dividend yield, and if the 10-year hits 2%, they're forecast. Dividend growth needs to keep up. That's our theme, inflation-protected yield. How much inflation protection do you need next year? And that's at the heart of these debates, these conversations we're having. Mike Collins is leaning the other way. That's a story for another time. From New York, let's get you some price action. Rip off the lid of this equity market, get you the sector breakdown. Here's Kriti Gupta. Well, good morning, John. Started off with a fairly broad rally, but essentially it is a tug of war tech that is changing the game. At the top of the leaderboard, you have consumer staples and materials, but at the bottom, consumer discretionary and information technology. And like you said, it's that tug of war. You got your Amazons, uh, your Apples, your Googles, your Microsofts. And the leader side, on gaining, on the other side, you have NVIDIA and Tesla weighing the market down. And John, it's no longer one clear trade for tech as it was for so long during the pandemic, which brings me to a check-in on those stay-at-home stocks. Uh, that was, have lost a lot of their momentum in the last two years since that major boom that you saw in 2020. And that's best exemplified this morning by DocuSign dropping almost 40% in regular trading, about 38% in pre-market trading after its third quarter billings and revenue forecast missed those estimates, John. Incredibly, thank you. That's the sector breakdown in the equity market. Here's your bond yield breakdown. Two-year yields higher by two basis points, just short of the year's high of about 65 
75 basis points. We had a look at that last week. On 10s, your 10-year totally unchanged now at 144. Coming up, the market moving events, your trading diary from New York City, the guide into the weekend just around a corner. This is Bloomberg. talking about Bloomberg surveillance. There's some guy out on Twitter who says, I look like I'm on I know, I know, sir. Do you think I need a lift? Is it time what that I... What do you say about me? What did that particular gentleman what? say about... Let's have a look. Oh, One of them life. is near 101 years of age. Which one would that be? The other has an ego in the orbit of Mars. <laughs> Who's that? <laughs> I had no idea. <laughs> Mrs. Lisa, the only chance to productive conversation. It's a fairly accurate summary of this show, isn't it, Tom? <laughs> the eyes, or should I do the whole thing? Recap the headlines. You do not want to miss this How story. How are you thinking about those dynamics? When you start late, at some point, developments on the ground force you to go faster than you would normally want to go. And if you go faster than you normally want to go, you risk breaking something. And that's the problem of a highly leveraged economy, is that if you are late, you risk making a policy mistake. Just a fantastic lineup this morning. Great to catch up with Mohammed, with Rick, with Anastasia, with Mike, to set us up for December 15th. Away from the payrolls report, out to next week, a CPI print next Friday, then on to that final Fed decision of the year. The price action looks like this on the S&P, down about a third of 1%, doing okay. The Russell underperforming, the Nasdaq down one full percentage point. Coming up very shortly, here's your trading diary. The ISM data at the top of the hour, then President Biden discussing the November payrolls report shortly thereafter. Big week ahead for central banks, Australia the rate decision on Tuesday. India, Brazil, Canada later in the week. Initial jobless claims on Thursday. And finally, we round out next week with CPI. Look out for that. We round out this week with Bloomberg Real Yield, an all-star lineup, 1 p.m. Eastern time. Francis Donald, Bob Michael, Krishna Mamani. Do not miss that. If I miss you, have a wonderful weekend. Thank you for choosing Bloomberg TV. This was the, the countdown to the open. This is Bloomberg. trillion dollars in spending, not increase inflation.
by increasing the productive capacity of this country. And uh, that's a very important thing that we, frankly, have not successfully done across most of my lifetime. You know, I've been waiting for this legislation for months since I became Transportation Secretary, but various presidents have been hoping to reach this day for decades, and it hasn't happened for all kinds of reasons. The American public has been rightly impatient. Now we're getting it done, both making up for lost time and laying a better foundation for the future. Let me also point out to the fact that part two of the president's agenda, what I like to call uh, the big deal, but part two of that, the, the Build Back Better Act, has even more that will help beat back inflation by lowering some of the costs that Americans feel most acutely, the cost of child care, the cost of health care, the cost of housing, the cost of prescription drugs, bringing those down while also making sure that we ease some of those labor market issues we have by making it easier for working parents to afford to go back to work. A lot's happening on Wall Street. It's the basic law of economics. The Fed is telling us this is transitory. Need to catch up? This is Bloomberg Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. We've got the information and insights. David, you just hit the nail right on the head. From business's most influential and instrumental. And that's the way you run good risk management. But we need to invest in our systems. Bloomberg Wall Street Week premieres Friday with replays all weekend on Bloomberg Television and Radio. On the supply chain, are you starting to see things improve? And if you are, where specifically, sir? Well, this year we have been mostly affected by the semiconductor situation. And uh, uh, we believe that the quarter three uh, was the quarter that was most affected. <laughs> Months after Hurricane Maria, Puerto Rico is still in peril. 